powered from the Perdomo Cigar Studios on the Black Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from the Drew State Studios in California. It's episode 197 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we welcome back Abe Flores as our special guest from PDR Cigars. And as always, the Primetime Show is sponsored by Saga Cigars. De Los Reyes introduces another chapter of the saga, the Saga Celez. So there's a Spanish word that means leisure after work in the spirit of the standing idea of owning your own journey and making your own saga. Saga Celeste is a perfect companion to enrich those moments of choice, making them truly yours. The Saga Celeste carries a blend of Criollo Olor and Piloto Cubano wrapped in a selected Ecuador shade Claro wrapper that generously delivers with elegance a surprisingly rich and balanced smoke. It's available in three sizes at an affordable price. Ask your retailer for Saga Celeste. And by Perdomo Cigars. Awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary brand has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. The Perdomo Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan sun-grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. <coughs> Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel aged wrappers with thick, high priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigar is a family owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida, with agricultural and manufacturing facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo State Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double Age 12 Year Vintage, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary, Perdomo Abano Bourbon Barrel Age, Perdomo Lot 23. Perdomo Menso 70 and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And our featured guest tonight is sponsored by Best Cigar Prices. Stock up for the sunny days at the lowest possible prices at your number one source for cigars and accessories, bestcigarprices.com. They got the best deals on exactly what you need to fill your long summer days with smoky satisfaction. Stocking over 8,000 unique items from over 800 top brands, Best Cigar Prices is the only online store with a best price guarantee. They'll beat any advertised price by $10. Best Cigar Prices is your source for the best summer cigar deals and the biggest brands and hard-to-find boutiques. Learn more and visit them online at bestcigarprices.com. That's bestcigarprices.com. And finally, by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app via mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. It's available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And as always, all the live streaming for the Primetime Network of Shows is sponsored exclusively by Drew Estate, as well as the California Studios for the Primetime Show. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Episode 197. Today is Thursday, August 5th, 2021. This is Will Cooper. I'm on the black stage here in the Perdomo Cigar Studios. Aaron Loomis is, uh, will be joining us. He's having technical issues. So uh, we will welcome Aaron in um, when he can get those resolved. But we wanted to have the show go on. Um, so without further ado, I want to uh, welcome back uh our special guest. I'm really glad we uh, are going to get a chance to talk to him. Uh, he is the one and only Abe Flores of PDR Cigars. Abe, welcome back to Prime Time. Thank you, Coop, for having me here. Well, great. It's been Abe, a long time. I know it's been a long time, <laughs> and you know I, we we did try to interview at the show. I know, but um. Sometimes it's not the best timing for everything. And I kind of said, to you, hey, let's just get you as soon as we get back. And uh, I was so glad you were able to get us a date and uh, make this happen. So thank you very much. No, thank you for having me here. Especially I couldn't really talk to you much at the last few days at the show. Well, it, it was it, it actually the funny thing is that that's not funny, but Bear, who was doing all the interviews this year for our team, he lost his I think I told you before, he lost his voice as well. So um you know, it's one of those things where no one was going to be able to talk and, and then the audio wasn't going to work. So um, but we're really, really glad uh, to have you here. You know, Abe, it's, it's kind of I kind of feel like I there's certain brands. I think I was talking to you also before the show that I kind of feel like I started out when I started doing what I do. And you're one of those brands from the very beginning. I mean, so it, it's so great to kind of have you on because and catch up with you every time um, for that. So I thank you very much for that. No, thank you, Coop. I, I think uh, we've been friends and 
I don't know, over 10 years now? But yeah, because Cigar English Coop's 11-year anniversary is coming up, and it's right yeah. when I started. Um, you were coming into Charlotte, um, and, and uh, we were really getting to know and love your brand um, at the time. Oh, yeah, I mean, and then I remember you did, like you sent me a picture. You were doing some sort of event. And you had like you bigger humidor and it was like all eighteen seventy eight Capo yeah. Maduros. You know what I'm <laughs> Cubano especial. Back then we used to call them Cubano especial. Yeah, you know that was the. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I mean those cigars. I mean, we really got. To, I mean, I remember when you were releasing those, right? So I mean, you, you, the Capo Maduro. Uh, there was the the red band. I think we called it the holiday blend. Because it kind of came, yeah. you know, the red team kind of came at Christmas. Um, the Capa Natural, the, uh, the Capa Habano, the Blue Band. So, I mean, I remember kind of going back then. And now this is 10 years. I'm like, wow, you know, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, it's come back quick. It, it came back quick. We're still quick. here. We're still here, <laughs> uh, which is all good. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like I said, it's uh, I'm, tonight I'm lighting up uh, the Azul, the uh, Connecticut Reserve Azul. Oh, can I, can I reserve? Yes. Yep. yep. Um, and I want to get, we'll get into, I know we're going to get into a lot because you've had a lot going on with, with PDR uh, over the last year. Um, you know, I don't know if we asked this last time, but if I did, I want to kind of re-ask the question again. Abe, what was your first experience like smoking a cigar? Uh, tobacco or, or cigar, cigar? Uh, a cigar cigar, like when you lit up a cigar for the first time. What, where mm. were you? What point in life were you? Do you remember that experience? I think the first cigar I smoked was in La Aurora. Uh, I think it was uh, a Cameroon or something like that. Uh, I was unfortunately very young. Uh, my cousin was coming down to see us that we were down in the, in the river. We were going to, we were all like, you know, we used to get together in the river and in, in Fula, everybody family get together and we, and we get like coolers and like, you know how people tailgate in the United States. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So we do it in the river, like we'll, we'll bring coolers and rum and beer and stuff like that. We all get together and barbecue and cook on the river and all that stuff. So I remember my cousin Che, uh, he was coming down, from, he came down to New York and went through Santo Domingo and he stopped somewhere and La Aurora, if you go through up and down anywhere in the Dominican Republic, you'll always find like a humidor in any rest stop of La Aurora cigars. So he, he got, um, I think it was the, the one, the classic, I can't remember. So he got, he got a Robusto of those and, and he brought, he bought like 12, like 10 of those and started passing it out. And he was smoking one and, and I was, <laughs> I was 13, I think. Uh, and I wanted to smoke one and I, and I started smoking it. And um, did I, I think I almost passed out. And my, <laughs> I, I, I get, well, it was a lot of underage. Well, it could have been the rum too. I was on the age <laughs> yeah. back then. So <laughs> could have been a mix between, you know, drinking Brugal and, and, uh, and uh, Brugal straight on the river and, and, and smoking about half of a cigar and then the next thing you know I'm you know I'm, I'm sleeping under a tree somewhere <laughs> passed out somewhere so that was my first experience um a re then after that I think we you know I didn't smoke for a while and the next cigar I smoked was was a cigar from um remember uh the guys from um they made a pipeline. Uh, 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 oh yeah, what's the name of the brand? Savanelli. Savanelli. You yeah. Know, Savanelli. Yeah. Ruben. Yeah. So yep. Ruben. Yeah. They. They. I met Ruben later on, and and I smoked a Savanelli classic. I think it was a Savanelli made by, by Fuente. I remember that. Yeah. Because Ruben told me it was a Savanelli made by Fuente, and I was much older then. Um, I think I was like eighteen. 19 years old then like 18 years old and then after that I've just been hooked I smoked a lot of cigars after that we, my cousin was bringing a lot of cigars from the DR and and just like from little factories Tamboril that was one line that we smoked um from the DR um Gamos was another one um you know there was a lot of lines back then uh, um there was one that Davidoff used to do was like was like something um 
it was a, it was like the seconds of the white labels. It was like, mm -hmm. oh my god, it was like something. That was, uh, it wasn't that. Was, uh, it was uh, it was uh, they call them something stock. Okay, can't ever can't remember. I smoked those, um, and and we were just like I was just doing that stuff. Nicaragua was not so big back then, you know. Right. I mean, back then the really good Nicaraguans were like Padrone, uh, uh, Padrone, and you know those were really good ones back then. Um, I think that's pretty much it. that's where I my canudo when I first, you know, that was hot doing the boom, you know. So that's pretty much what I stuck to in the beginning. You know, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. you. Your connection broke up a little bit. I think we got you through okay. Give me one second. Let me get off Wi-Fi. Oh. Okay. My, my Wi-Fi gets, my no gets problem, a little Abe. shitty. No problem at all. all right. We understand. So uh, just for folks who know, we're talking to Abe Blur as a PDR Cigars here on the Primetime Show. Um, and um, Aaron Loomis is actually having technical issues on his end as well. Um, so uh, I appreciate everyone's patience here. And then we got back Abe. Yeah. You see me now? We see you now. Good. Yep. So yeah, those those were the cigars. Like in the beginning, like La Rue was a big thing as a Dominican. Um, you know, a Dominican brand. That was our Dominican, you know, brand that we all really smoked. And if you were Dominican, you really like supported La Rue most most of all. Um, Cabernet was another big brand back into those days, um, but. Then I started like varying off a little bit with like punch, uh, stuff from Villas on, you know, um, back then, uh, Onyx, uh, oh, yeah. uh yep, I Seagull and uh, uh, Helix, remember Helix? I remember Helix, yeah. Uh, it's about yeah. that's going back 2000, mid 2000, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I forgot about Helix, yeah. Bucanero, remember Bucanero? I remember Bucanero as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Bucanero. I smoke. I remember smoking a Bucanero. I used to smoke a lot of those. A friend of mine used to send me a lot of those back in the day. Um, yeah. From those guys do, did a lot of stuff. Uh, at Puro Sindo, I mean, at Cubano, oh my God. Puro Sindo used to do one was uh, Cubaleados. Cubaleados. Yes. Remember yep. those? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah that's when I met. Yeah. Hmm? We were just talking to Eddie Ortega about that last week, that brand. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie started, Eddie was married to uh, Rolando's daughter. Yeah. Uh huh. Then, so yep. I had a, a few kids with him. Right. Yep. So I remember going to the, to the first cigar shop. He had, uh, he still had it. And up in, uh, it was like New Jersey, like right in the border of New Jersey, New York. I forget what, it's like Livery, New Jersey or something. It was like, that's where he started. He started in the basement of that, of uh -huh. that cigar, cigar shop, yeah. rolling cigars. And then he grew bigger. Rolando told me the story. Like he he started like just having guys roll there, and then he started getting bigger and bigger. And then he actually set up a factory in the Dominican Republic. And then um, you know he didn't do so well, and eventually he moved to to Honduras. That's that's the story he told me. And then I'm from Bonao, and he trademarked Bonao. For cigars, and I, the, oh, I remember talking to him. He's like, "You owe me that. You owe me that brand." <laughs> and, he, and he's like, "Yeah." Before I die, he died. He never gave me the brand. <laughs> so. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so you were smoking. I mean, but when, but when you were smoking these cigars, uh, I know you were you uh, you were living in the U.S. Correct? Yeah, I was. Well, when I was thirteen, I I moved thirteen. 14 years old to the United States, Massachusetts. I grew up in a town called Salem, Mass. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know them. Yep, I know they Salem. Hang, they hang witches out there. Exactly, so. yeah. <laughs> that's how we know them. <laughs> yeah, that's how you know. I live actually near to pretty close to a place called Gallows Hill where they hanged all the witches. Um, went to high school out there. Um, you know, I used to, you know, play a lot of music and, 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 uh, was an orchestra baseball and, and things like that when I was younger and uh oh, that was that was a great experience and then um started going to college I, I really wanted to become an artist try to do music school art school and eventually I just 
decided to, and at one point I thought I wanted to become a doctor. And then uh, I worked at a hospital for many years. I did like, you know, lab technician, lab certification and a bunch of stuff. And, and after two years, year and a half, like that's when like the dot-com stuff started picking up. And I was like, you know, I'm better with computers. And I started coding C, C++ and um, virtual basic and, and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and I was, you know, I was, was doing co-op at a company called, back then it was called Bell Atlantic. And, it, and they were going to launch the first uh, big yellow, like uh, online yellow pages. Mm -hmm. So we were a team doing coding for that HTML. I went to a school called Merrimack College. That's where I finished my, my college education, pretty much. Yeah. In Andover, Merrimack. Merrimack. Yep, yeah, I've heard of Mer Merrimack. Um, is it New York? Or no, I Merrimack. Is it meant? It's right on the border of a, of a, like Lawrence, Mass, and then Salem, Salem, New Hampshire. Okay, so it's, it's further. It's way further out then. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a really good hockey team, I think. I think they have a really good uh, hockey team. Division one, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then I, that's why I've heard of them. That's why. So it's not like, but I wasn't I wasn't good on the location there. I try um, I try I try to get in on a hockey team, but I couldn't I couldn't get in. You know, Dominican on skates, you know, we're just not that good. <laughs> <laughs> I, play, I, I did I did like, you know, I, my roommates were was in the in the in the hockey team and then I helped out as much as possible. It's just, you know. We're you know Dominicans don't are not that good on on skates you know we do okay you know listen listen uh <laughs> there's parts of our, our country where people aren't good on skates so um no I mean hockey's a I, I'm a big hockey guy so uh, uh Aaron who's not on would I, now I can talk hockey because he hates hockey uh, but, oh. but no I yeah I mean but I watched a lot of college hockey even growing up because in the Northeast it was popular so um, oh yeah I mean, if you watch the Bean Cup. That's yeah. all. I mean, that's yeah. during that during that season. That's all you watch, man. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was hockey, and then I did. I try. I did lacrosse for a little bit. I, uh, I yeah. Didn't, I'm you know. I did baseball. I was you know. I did baseball and and uh, yeah. football and, uh, and wrestling. That's pretty oh. much what I did. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I guess when I remember, we've talked a few times, and you told me this. Your, your venture into the cigar industry came through the IT route, right? You were working at Tinderbox or you got hooked up with Tinderbox to start working on their website? What the, you know, the thing is, I had a cousin of mine, same guy I, always, I keep on mentioning, Che, who was uh, working in Manhattan, Mid Midtown Manhattan, and right in the beginning of the boom and stuff like that. And he will bring a lot of cigars and he will sell them. And that's where I started smoking with him and stuff. And he will send me cigars. And, you know, I was in high school and beginning of college and stuff. And I, I need, you know, I couldn't be paying all that money all the time. I, you know, I smoke cigars with friends. And then I, I use it as a way as a little side hustle where I make extra money. And I sold it. Hey, people are like, hey, you Dominicans? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, can you give me cigars? I'm like, a good price. I'm like, yeah, I'll give you a better price. You know, whatever. So that's the way I made extra cash. At the hospital, I was working at Salem Hospital, uh, uh, at Liberty Tree Mall, things anywhere I was working at, like a manager or whatever. Like, hey, you know, you hook me up and I'll get them a bundle, a ten pack, and things like that. And that's why I made extra money so I could buy, pay for school and and pay for instruments because I was a musician and, and finance little things that I was doing. I wanted to get into the cigar business, but I just didn't know what to do. So, I, you know, even back then I didn't know, you know, how to get into it. Other than, you know, I used to go into a cigar shop and I see usually like the typical guys sitting there smoking cigar and, you know, I, I, like, I, you know, how you get into this? Well, I, I don't feel like sitting down at a cigar lounge and that's how I get into the cigar business. That's, that's not the way I wanted to really learn every aspect, not just what my grandfather taught me from, from cultivating tobacco and what he did. You know, I really wanted to learn how to, how to build my own, you know, a cigar, you know, the components from filler binder and wrapper. So when I was in IT, when I was, when I was working at, um, in, in Boston and stuff and like right at 9 11, everything went to shit. And I was working for a French company called Alta Vista. Um, it was doing like the, the Windows 2000 migration, you know, and we were doing like all of that, you know, publishing uh, all the license, how to be like uh, license compliant. So it was like one of these softwares that 
you installed on the network and, and made sure your license was compliant. And if you didn't, you had to like, be, you know, call Microsoft or whoever you had these licenses and become compliant before you got fined. So it was a company that did this, this type of programming and, and application. And then 9-11 came along and everything stopped. So I was out of work, didn't know what to do. Um, and I tried to say, hey, screw it. I'll just go back to the Republic and, and uh, get in, learn how to do my thing, call our up and say, hey, you know, I'm A. Flores, I'm Dominican and, you know, I'm college educated and stuff. And, you know, I want to learn how to make cigars and, you know, you know I'm, I'm pliable, tell me what to do and, and what, what do I need to do to get a job out there? So they told me how much they paid and, and as, a, as an apprentice and to start and I did the math and was like, really, it, it'd be better for me to just build websites on the side in the beginning. And then I found a, a posting for a company called Tinderbox where they wanted to do an online site. Uh, they needed somebody to slowly integrate their, all their call center, the accounting, accounting software, uh, warehouse management. They, I mean, they did a lot of fulfillment for all the other. Remember, Tinderbox was huge at one point, you know? Yeah, oh yeah. Cinebox was, was like the McDonald's of, of the of the cigar industry. Yeah, they were huge, you know? huge franchises, yeah. Huge franchise, I mean, they got up yeah. to almost 400 locations, you know? So when I looked them up, I was like, this is, this is perfect for me, I could go in. I was not really expecting to, to be making cigars, but at least I, I was gonna be closer to doing what I wanted to do. Um, and I knew how to build websites and, you know, build databases and, and uh, you know, I, I, I learned quick. So I moved down and I got the job and, and I started working on their infrastructure. Um, and it took a couple of years to get the site up, a website to the box.com and get the warehouse going and, and fulfillment and call center and fulfilling for all the other tinder boxes and warehousing all their inventory and things like that. And working with the with the management and and that's how I started going to our TDA back then, you know, um, and being involved with the buying and Tinderbox when they showed up, they they commanded presence, you know. Every president for every big company sat down with the heads of Tinderbox, you know. Yeah. So I was present during those those negotiations where, you know, when they needed you know certain deals for all the Tinderboxes and things like that was there. That's how I I got my foot in the door yep. and I thank them for it because if it wasn't for them, I, I would have not been here because I, that gave me the, the, the opportunity to use my skills as a programming programmer, uh, marketer, and then be able to start really dabbling into blending because eventually as I grew into the company, you know, certain people in certain departments started going under me and then the buyer started had to report to me and things like that and i realized you know every time a, a manufacturer would come in and visit and they would see me smoking i had my whiteboard up with all the you know the campaigns we're doing right, and, right. All stuff. <laughs> and then they're like you know they go by my you know the buyer was like at the end and they go by my my door and say like, who the hell are you i'm like oh i'm abe i'm like you know marketing director i'm you know i gotta do all this shit it's like oh well, when are you gonna promote my stuff and, like, and they had to talk to me anyways because i had a you know i'm the one who was setting setting up their promotions and then the guy's like, you know, do you, you know more than this guy in tobacco? It's like, yeah, man, I just, you know, I guess too much shit, man. I, I just got to, you know, I got to try to get sales up and I got to do this. And, you know, eventually, like, I, I started asking to travel, to visit the factories and, and learn. And that's how I, I got, I caught the bug when I started seeing fermentation process, uh, leaf veining, you know, uh, a blending setting up doing blends for, for yeah and the 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 packaging stuff was easy for me because i'm a de graphic designer right right you know I, I you see everything you see i'm i'm the, pretty much the guy who designs it that's that's not a big deal for me because i always been a creative individual um i just took my creativity to making cigars and then finding myself you know this is really what i wanted to do you know, and being a young guy still to launch a brand at 27 years old, now I'm 45. <laughs> it's, uh, 
takes a lot of balls. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. Of oh yeah. I mean, I yeah, definitely, definitely. And, uh, I mean, this thing's grown for you. It's, uh, and we're going to get into a lot of that as well. Um, <laughs> you, I know you had, uh, when did you actually hit, go back to the Dominican Republic? I've been living living here, or, or, or when you full went time, to, or uh, I'll let you rephrase it. When you went to when you decided you were going to make your cigars back in the Dominican Republic, because I know for a while you were doing some stuff in New Orleans, right, at Don Leoncio. Well, Don Leoncio, they were they were my partners. Yes. So, yes. so they they. Uh, the factory was called Only Enzo Cigars. Yep. And, and um, so what happened, it came to, to a point where I said to myself, I either do it now mm-hmm. or I'm, or just be complacent and be happy doing what I'm doing, working for a .com, maybe work for another .com and be a cataloger and, and just be an employee the rest of my life. Or I'm young enough. I don't care if I lose it all and fall on my feet, I can still recover, you know what I'm saying? Um, and these guys from Don Liencio, uh, they had the new own, they used to be partners in the new own cigar factory. And then they had the, the place in, in, they had a place in, in Pensacola and then they moved to New Orleans. And um, they had a little factory, very small factory in Tamboril, who I was buying stuff from them, like just cheap shit, you know, bundles and things like that um nothing really out of the world you know it was decent blends but really not you know it was for for quick you know uh okay stuff um they offered me um you know they were really the the ones that pushed me to 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 do this you know because i i was part of me was thinking about just getting a job um i couldn't get anything decent in the Dominican public and I had like a couple offers to either go to Honduras or, or Nicaragua to just go down there, move and, and do what I do in those countries, you know? And, and that's what I wanted to do. And uh, Juan, uh, who's Juan Rodriguez, um, came to me and he's like, oh, you don't want to do that. You're Dominican. You don't want to go to Nicaragua. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, know, you know, you're not going to like it. It's too, too third world. You know, it's like, well, the DR is not that, you know, it's more modern, but, you know, I can't You know, come partnership and, you know, but, you know, so, you know, I, I just took a risk and then uh, I'm, I'm going to be off front with you. I mean, the first you know, six years was, was tough. It was tough, touch and go. Um, I still had to do build websites on the side and do side jobs on the side for extra money because we weren't really, you know, getting anything going. And, and it took time for us to really, for me to find the right, because we launched on the, with Pinay de Rio. Yes. Yep. You know, and Pinay de Rio, um, was okay we did fine but it was not really you know it was it wasn't really catch on the the brand that really catched on was 1878 Cubano yep, Especial, yep. which we were talking about right that, yep that was the brand that one day i just said you know i need to simplify everything i need to come up with something really easy simple uh spicy good price point cigar with a little bit of unique look to it you know at that time and we launched cubano Pesiad, three sizes capa madura um i think it was a robusto five by fifty five by fifty two six by fifty two and seven by fifty two and then uh and that's what we launched it at i can't remember which one i think it was before new orleans show and it retailed at you know 450 for a robusto and that was like unheard of back then yeah. remember yeah. it was like oh my god four bucks for, for, for a cigar in a box, you know, yeah. and, you know, that really like got the brand cooking, you know, um, people forgot about P- P- Pina de Rio and that's when we became PDR, you know, um, PDR just like grew from there. Yeah. And then, you know, we started with the Connecticut and then we did the holiday blend, Reserva, Reserva Dominicana, Capa Oscura, and then Capa Habano. 
And that's where it really we focused on that for many years. That really, really, AT, PDR 1870 and Kawana really was the, the line that really got us in the map. And then like, and it was like the light switch, you know, next thing you know, I was like, oh, okay, now I can, now I can focus on this, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember we were talking about when those hit Charlotte um, and, you know, it was the, the when the 1870 hit, everyone that I was like, just there were just so many smokers where I smoked that were gravitating to those cigars. Um, and it was something for everybody in that line. I mean, like I said, um, they had the Maduro, you had the four blends. They, they, they displayed real well in the store because you had, mm-hmm. you know, nice, nice calls. It gave you great shelf presence. And, um, you know, like I said, I think we all, I, I was always partial to the holiday blend, um, which was the Oscura. Um, and, yep. uh, but yeah, it was a lot of excitement with that. But you know, I gotta say something. The Pinar del Rio Oscuro was fantastic, and Bear and I have talked about that cigar a lot. That was a gem you had that um, we, yeah. we both really enjoyed. I, I think Bear may still have a couple of them lying around, but but I remember I bought quite a few of those. Uh, I had the blue, I had the blue and the silver band. I think it was. Yeah, it was yeah. a P P A brow leaf. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was good. It was a good cigar. Yeah, you, uh, yeah. It, was, it was very unique cigar. It was, it was. We really enjoyed it. Then remember, um, I came out with that platinum. But platinum, uh, all but that uh, had that stare yeah, that silver. Yeah, that was a strong cigar. That, that was very. Strong. That was a for that time. Yeah. For that time, that was very strong. And then you came out with Solomon with that. You had a Solomon size of that. Yeah, yeah. that was my first Solomon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah people like enjoy that. The problem is, then I ran out of the wrapper, and I couldn't really continue doing it. So, oh, it was good. It was a good cigar. I was uh, thinking about relaunching it because I now have the tobacco and I still have those bands. I was thinking about relaunching it in like packs of 10, like the boxes of 10 or something like limited edition, you know, uh, you know, Pinar de Rio, uh, Reserva Superior, you know, just like do like 10 packs of the Solomons only, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I, it was a good, it was really good. It had a, a yeah. And it was just beautifully made. Um, hey, I just want to introduce uh, Aaron. Uh, welcome, Aaron. Aaron, it looks like you got your uh, technical issues resolved there. Yeah, sorry. I, it's a poor entrance. I had uh, technical issues early with the sound, so I made it, though. Thanks, Aaron, for joining. Yep. We, do, we do appreciate it. Uh, always appreciate the effort. Uh, nothing like a technical problem to, to enter That's the right. show there. <laughs> awesome. So uh, what are, you, are you smoking anything tonight, Aaron? Yeah, I am smoking the uh, AFR-75. Nice. This yeah, is nice. like the, the Catador Patola, I think. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I have like the I have like the new one actually. Of that that's what I'm going to smoke okay. next. But I'm smoking the yeah. uh, I'm smoking the Connecticut Valley Reserve right now. Mm, nice. So, yep. So, so we're just uh, yeah, we're just going down a, a a little memory walk with Abe here as far as uh some of some of the cigars he's had. Um, nice. but Abe, you had um, it, you talk about 1878 as a breakthrough. Um, but really it was um. It, well, it was the A Flores line that landed you the big rating. Uh, it landed you that top 10 cigar. It was the first uh, signature line, the Seri Privada, that yep. got got me to be top 10, top eight, where other sides, top one. I mean, it's, it's, it was the Seri Privada, first uh, cigar that really got me over the top, over the hump. Um, to really everybody to get to know who a floor is because before that was just pdr nobody knew really who a Flores was and um there was something really special with that cigar um and i worked very hard on that one on that and that blend and it just came through I and mean, it was not like a very strong cigar it was like medium to full flavor right and, but it had a very unique profile and i don't know maybe i i, I didn't think it was going to really do that crazy well but it, it did phenomenal you know we were in backward for a very long time you know so it, it, it blew up um 2014 uh really that was the year for pdr that was the that was the, the pop you know that really got crazy for us you know yeah that was um and you had the right around that time you had you were making cigars for gurker and had the, the 125th anniversary also around that time got you another top 10 out of the factory. That was uh, actually the year before. It was the, the year, year before. before okay, a, so, so a, yeah. We got number nine. Okay. 
And then we got La Polina Classic. I got like number 11. Then we had another one, the Black Label. I got them like 16. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we had a lot of, you know, 93s, 94s, 92s, you know, the, you know, even Lancero uh, Habano, 1878, got, we got a 92 uh, on it rating uh, on that. I mean, we had a lot of good ratings with, with those flying back then. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So, and I remember you, you were mentioning the, uh, the Siri Provada. There was a, the Rigato was the one that got the top 10, but there was also an Oscuro that you have too with that. Yeah. I mean, well, back then it was called Habano. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, everything was, uh, we, we changed everything to Rosado or Claro. Okay, yep. You know, uh, mostly because as, as we, as my brand got into Pro Cigar, and we started really getting to more international uh, distribution. It was really hard for me to sell everything in my portfolio that had the word Habano. So for me to have Habano in the United States and the same cigar Coros out in, in someplace else or Claro, it was becoming very hard. So we just renamed everything uh, or either Sun Grown, if it's Sun Grown wrapper or, or it could be Habano seed, but it was Sun Grown. Right. Or if it's a Rosado, you know, that's what we did. The Habano word is no longer, uh, the, no longer shows up in, in anything with PDR. Okay. Is that, is that because of the whole Pinar del Rio thing? Or is it just, you just, it's more for Pro Cigar, you're saying? No, as, as you get into different international markets like Germany. Yeah. Like, like when, when you start selling something, <laughs> I remember I got into Switzerland and we had to put like stickers on, on the, on the on the boxes and say Claro and then take the secondary band off and it was just just became too too much of a hassle and I was like you know what I'm just renaming everything and just making it simple and you know you just can't have different things in different countries it just became really logistically just became hard so it's just easier for me as we our distribution became international just simplify everything to be one thing one word people are understand you tell them if the description says Habano on the on the blend description they know it's, Hab- it's Habano, you know, right, right. but on the band it says Rosado and, you know, customers are not going to say anything, Yeah, you know, yep. but the problem is if it says Habano and then next thing you know, that customer is going to hold it off and it's like, oh no, you can't have Habano because the only, the only word Habano come from, you know, you know, Cuba, you know, so yeah, we had to change it. Yeah, I, I know, I know Perdomo had that issue with theirs and they had to call it Nicaragua and I think La Roma de Cuba has called it as La Roma de Caribe or something like that because, they got, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's so I can understand that. That made, that makes a lot of sense too. Um, you the other thing you mentioned with PDR, you've kind of recently, I don't want to say you haven't rebranded it, but you've kind of changed the meaning of PDR now going forward to kind of reflect what you're doing in the Dominican. Well, the thing is, as I am the last member to join Pro Cigar, it's been now six years and as a pro cigar member we have a responsibility to promote the Dominican Republic sure so so I remember when I first joined and I, I said this to Greg Martola same thing when he when he did the article um, I remember Hanky you know I, I had some relationship with him because I know I knew him back in the day at Tinderbox and and that was part of the reason why they brought me in. They saw I, I got the articles and I got that big article in Cigar Fish Now, that big article in Cigar Journal and the ratings. And they brought me into PDR, uh, brought PDR into Pro Cigar because, you know, they knew I was a good guy. They known me for many years. They know I'm, a, you know, I'm just a regular guy like you guys just putting their pants one at a time, just try to grow, you know, their name. And, uh, he, you know, he knew me and, um, he pretty much put me on his wing and say, Hey, I'm going to, you know, tell you what really pro cigar is about and you're now part of it. And you got to really understand that, you know, we're here. Pro cigar is about Dominican Republic mm-hmm. and nothing about nothing else is about Dominican history. And I'm going to tell you our history. And I learned a lot and I call it like the gospel of hanky. You know what I'm saying, so I started learning the gospel of hanky. So I started going first thing, I remember, and I and I, I sent uh, Greg a picture. And back then, I weighed like 380 pounds. It was like me, 
and Tony Gomez, like he was all skinny. Was like, remember <laughs> yeah. he used to sh- shave his head really sh- like tight and hit like not the beard, you know what I'm saying? It was yeah. me and like Nidika, <laughs> and we were and we were in this like uh, first event in Milan. We were in a pro cigar event. We looked like a bunch of gangsters. You know what I'm saying? It, it just like it, it looked like the scene from like The Godfather. All these Italians are in black, you know, and and like Chanel and all that stuff, and all the girls like smoking long cigarettes and things like that. I was just like, I'm, I'm looking around. I was like, oh my god, it looks like The Godfather here. It's like The Godfather <laughs> movie yeah. all around. So you see Hanky, you know, the ambassador of of, of uh, the main public, and <laughs> and he's and then when he starts talking about. You know, everybody's like big Gucci glasses and all that stuff. And I'm just like, wow. I'm like, I'm like, and I just and I bought these, you know, I bought this suit at men's warehouse and look at these guys, you know, they're <laughs> all like you know, couture and like, you know, fucking custom suits and shit like that, you know. So and I'm and Hanky started talking and and that's where I really like I just stood there and I just started like was an odd. Like I just like he started talking about the history about tobacco, but not about tobacco in Cuba, tobacco about the Republic. You know, the Tainos, the, the first guys, the first the Indians, you know, the, it was it was used for for meditation, for spiritual. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we were the first ones to, you know, Tainos were all over the Caribbean and how it grew and how the mar- how it became from, you know, a, a, a meditation thing to a, a pleasure thing and then and then it started becoming a pipe tobacco and and how we started getting into all these different industries back in the you know third in the 1800s and the in the in the, in the 1920s and 30s and that's how it started going so cuba had their thing but the dr was not wasn't far apart you know so i just started really like falling in love with the whole history of it and and i started listening more and more and more about you know, we're, we're, it's, I, I'm a very strong, back then I, I fell in love with like, before Pro Cigar, and part of the reason why we were copying United Rio is because I fell in love with Cuba. You know what I'm saying? I fell in love with the tradition. I fell in love with the, with the, with the techniques and, and the way these Cuban seeds, you know, Cuba 98 and Coro, and Havana, Havana 2000, Havana 99, uh, Havana with Arriba, all these Cuban seeds, Really, I like those profiles, but a lot of those seeds also came from the Dominican Republic that went right. to Cuba and came back. And 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 he started explaining to me that, and it was like, okay, so we're we're like really married to each other. It's just Cuba got much more of a hype than us, you know. So as years go by, my blends, my blending started changing. We started more promoting more of our tobacco. Not so much, you know, we still do a lot of Cuban seeds, but it's Cuban seed grown in the Republic. We do Alor, we San Vicente, and Piloto Cubano. But back then I started really doing, you know, back in the day, you know, we were all like 80% Nicaragua, 90% Nicaraguan tobaccos and, and things like that. And then now I'm more, I flipped it. I'm more about 80% Dominican Republic than and 20% Nicaragua fill it. And I do a lot of tobacco, a lot of stuff with Reyes and, and Hochi and stuff like that. Interesting. So, interesting. so when you, you kind of did a, I think you mentioned, you kind of alluded to this. PDR 1878, that was the reason why you uh, you kind of rebranded that slightly, right? To kind of reflect that? Was that what you, the reason why you did that? PDR, the new PDR. The, re- the, the Recordando? Yeah. Santiago. Yep. It, I, sure, and I just call it Santiago. It, it was called Recordando Santiago. Uh-huh. Because it was something that we were going to do. Remember, you know, pandemic came in, we had Pro Cigar, and I was going to do like a big thing with a canvas and I had Fabian do this artwork and stuff. And then, and we were going to do just like limited edition 1878. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, I wanted like with the Trujillo Cadillac, you know, you know how Camp David had that, that Trujillo oh, yeah. Cadillac, you know what oh, thing? Yeah. And I wanted like, I saw like an old picture with a, all the Cadillacs in front of like, you know, uh, when the building, you know, historia and the Monumento was made. And I was like, you know, it'd be really badass just to have the Cadillac and, you know, like that sky, you know, when the, when the sun is about to come down, it has like these purple colors and blue, you know, and, and this, color, you know, when, when they light up some, the monument. So Fabian, Fabian, I uh, you know, I know, you know, Fabian. Yeah. Um, 
drew up this whole thing and we were just going to do this uh, auction and then pandemic came and then I didn't know what to do. So, you know, we were closed. We started going again. We couldn't get boxes going. And I was going to do this like humidor with this, with the artwork and all that stuff. And that's when I met the guys from Alsac labels and they were doing this like whole new technique with, with, with paper wrap and wood boxes. And they said they can come up with something pretty, almost like 3D would make the mountain come out. And, you know, and it's like, we tried it and it came out awesome. And that's the reason we, we launched, uh, we first launched it as Recordando Santiago and then it just reduced it as, you know, 1878 Santiago, you know? Yep. So, uh, yeah, a couple of things on that first, uh, I did a Zoom call with my dad and I showed him a picture of the box because uh, he's, he's a big Cadillac fan. So he uh, loved your work. Um, mm -hmm. He's not a huge cigar guy, but uh, I, I'm going to send him some <laughs> or see him. But yeah, he uh, he just loved it. I said, you got to see this, dad. Um, and so he, he was I just want to pass that along to you. But you, all, you you mentioned this as well. The blends, the blends did change. Right. And they're more Dominican. Like you said, there's more Dominican now in these blends than there were before. Yeah, it's it's. Before it was, you know, 80% Nicaragua and a little bit, you know, 80% yeah. Nicaragua. And, and now pretty much the only thing that's not Dominican is the rapper. Right. You know, uh, I'm still, you know, I still fight with rappers from the VR. Uh, I'm not saying we cannot come up with good rappers. It's just Ecuador is just so much. Yeah. So much. <sighs> It, it silkier and smoother and, and burns really great. You know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, it's just for me, Ecuador rapper is the max. And, you know, I'm not saying like there's no producer that can come up with a good Dominican rapper. It's just for me, my blending Ecuador rappers are the best. The Maduros I use, I start switching everything from Marapiraca to San Andres. Because I think San Andres is a great rapper, tastes great, burns awesome, has that smoky taste, you know. Um, Arapiraca from Brazil just started having a lot of issues in the last seven years. You know, Arapiraca just doesn't taste the same like they used to. Remember how great Arapiraca was? It was just like, oh, it was like freaking eating chocolate. You know what I'm saying? Yes, like, yeah, know, exactly. And then Arapiraca just started like tasting like, hey, you know what I'm saying? And it was just like, yeah, you know. Matafina was awesome. And like now it's like, mm. you know, it's like, I don't know, for me, I, I might be wrong. I don't know. We, you know, I just started having issues with the way it was, how Brazil was, was functioning. And their farming techniques change because their social environment change, you know, and they just don't, these are the farmers that I've talked to, they just, they can't get, as much quality they can um in Spanish as the heat they can demand so much quality out of them back like back in the day where they could like no this is what it is we'll pay for this and this is what it is you know now it's like okay this is what we can give you and most of this like short fillers you know yeah yeah, yeah. you've worked with Dominican rappers though before I, I'm right I'm not wrong on that you have used Dominican rappers on your blends yes I did okay what's the, what's the, the, the 1878 um, it's Kappa Sangro, right yeah Sangrone and the holiday brand. Oh well, yeah, that's right. We're, we're both Dominican, yeah. They were both uh, uh, both Dominican rappers. So there was and some, then, I mean, yeah. And but the problem is, it was good, and then I I started having issues, and then I and then I eventually I just I switched it all to Ecuador. It was just about easier for me. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that as well. Mm -hmm. Um. You've, in general, in the last two, maybe two plus years, you have, there's been a major, you have re redesigned the whole portfolio from top to, I think everything's been hit, right? Well, what, the pandemic pretty much, uh, I started about two years ago. Yeah. To re restructure, reblend, reworked everything. And, um, and again, a lot of it was mostly because you know, 2014 was big. 2015 was big for PBR. We were doing so much. We had these humongous booths at the show. Um, I started really like only like in the factory. We had like 700 employees and 
and it was there's so much stuff and I had like a national sales manager and I had all these people and, but it wasn't me managing it like the way I was when I was smaller right. you know so people just started losing focus and it was so big I couldn't control so I'm gonna be up front like you know things were not things started changing where we couldn't really control where our cigars were going. I couldn't control because there was so much. I couldn't, it was like a big elephant. It became a big elephant. It was just me. Yeah. You know? So I, I, I was too much, you know? And back then, then I bought out my partners and it was just me and Luis and Luis sent me to retired. So I was doing so much by myself. And then I had like national managers, regional managers, you know? and I couldn't be on top of them. And then they, were, they started doing things without me without my approval mm -hmm. you know and then even manufacturing certain the departments were doing things without because it was so much i couldn't check every cigar you know so there's a lot of like disparity all over the place i still i decided to like start to shrink down to the way i was you know back of the way 2012 2008 you know uh eight to 12 that were we had a small production i can control everything you know more like like a la floor it's the smaller tighter neater you know and it's just a couple people and nothing can really get out of the box you know so if you're if you're really big for me to get really big you have to have the infrastructure and you have to be a large company like an alta this a general you know, to be able to manage or, or have the right people to help you to control the growth. We grew so bad, so quickly. I didn't have the right people in place to control everything, you know? Right. So I decided to just like start from scratch, go back to, to, the, to the drawing board. What made PDR? Right. What made PDR great when we first, when 1878 came out, you know? Good yeah. tobacco, good cigars, good prices, consistency, um, not having a lot of back orders. So I started weeding down facings, weeding down pack, you know, making sure my packaging, I am able to fulfill, making sure this, the Vitolas that we're making, we standardize everything to three sizes for 1878. Um, you know, eliminating a lot of things like you show like AFR 75. That was a that was a, a, a limited edition that we did every three months. Like we took it all out or the, the, the market, the, the city privada, we took it out of the market, you know, and then the pandemic came in and I really had to really like reduce everything. We, we were, we were closed for four months. So we started from, from scratch. Like we had to start small again. So I went from having a production of 40,000, 50,000 cigars a day down to like, producing 2000 a day and now we're up to 15,000 a day now mm -hmm. it's been mm -hmm. well, pandemic has been a year now right yeah so yep. we're doing about 15,000 cigars now but it's controlled because i i'm the one me and two three and three guys that's it you know we're on we're on the floor and uh, and it, and it and the pandemic was great for me because i didn't have to travel yeah i could be there you know what i'm saying i could be there every day from, from seven o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock at night, you know, and, and I can be on the floor and I can, and just like, we really controlled everything. Um, I think my quality is now better than even back in 2012. I think my quality is better than ever. And the consistency is better than ever. And I think also back in the beginning, one thing with Pinar de Rio, I was always buying a lot of tobacco from different places and all that stuff. I think for you guys, for a smoker and for me, um, you know, I'm going to, you know, I was a big scotch tricker, not anymore because, you know, gastric sleeve, you know, I used to weigh like, you know, remember 380 pounds, you know, I drink more like, you know, like beer and, and wine and stuff like that. And I drink, you know, if I drink like one scotch, I'm passed out, you know, so, <laughs> so for real, I'm a light, I'm a lightweight now. Big yeah. lightweight. Join the, know, club, so. yeah, join the club, baby. <laughs> Yeah, so big lightweight. So, uh, but back in the day, I drank a lot of Johnny Walker. What makes Johnny Walker black? Great. Because you can drink Johnny Walker now, and five and two months, six months later, you buy another Johnny Walker, and it tastes the same. Yep. Right? You buy the same bottle of Johnny Walker in New York, and then you buy the same bottle of Johnny Walker in, in Thailand, it tastes the same. Right? 
I realized why people buy Macanulo, why people buy Romeo, why people buy, you know, these, some of these big brands, you know, always, they can, they stick to a certain profile, certain consistency, they have a certain amount of inventory. Padron, why people buy Padron all the time? They're great. You can smoke a Padron now, 10 years later, they says what? The same, yeah. right? So I realized I got, I had to stop doing this where I will buy all these small little, if you're doing a small batch limited run thing, great, no problem. But the problem is if you're doing buying from all these different farms, they can only give you X amount of tobacco for an X amount of production. And then when, and if it, let's say it, it becomes a hit, like remember uh, the silver band for Pinar de Rio. Yeah. That became a hit. I ran out of the tobacco. Oh, so I had to like break my head, try to figure out, try to do this. Try to do the blend again, come out of the way, and and it, w- it didn't work out. People noticed it, you know. So, in the end, I realized it just doesn't work out. You got to just work with farmers and suppliers that can give you the same tobacco, the same consistency, and the same quality year after year after year after year after year after year after year. Hochi Blanco is one of those guys. Yep. Leo Reyes, Los Reyes is one of those guys. ASP is one of those guys. Yeah. You know what I'm saying for rappers, Turan is one of those guys. Uh, Placencia is one of those guys. I weeded out all these small farmers, and now I simplified my my my. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying I don't do limited stuff. They can come up, you know. Leo Reyes has a lot of different seed profiles. Yeah. You know, he has these things called Negrito and all this stuff, but he doesn't have a lot of it. So right. I, he tells me. I only have like a hundred bales. Okay, perfect. Maybe I'll do a limited edition for China, but I won't do it for the United States because I know the cons- the consumption of the United States. Gonna, you know, yeah. saying they they like it. Then next thing you know, my all my salespeople, are like, yeah, let's sell this. I'm like, <laughs> right. I can't. You know, what I'm saying yeah. then right. I'm breaking my head to try to figure out how to come up with a similar profile, and people are not that stupid anymore. I'm saying if you notice, cool. The palettes have changed. The consumer has changed. Internet has made these made the consumer smarter. The cigar smoker is a much more educated cigar smoker now compared to where it was 20 years ago. You know that. Yeah. Black and white. <laughs> yeah, you know, Eve, I don't know. I'm just like listening to this is like amazing because I've been so down on the limited market in the last few years. And I think you're shedding some light on why I've been down on it now. I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, because I just haven't seen like eight or nine years ago, the limiteds were really cool and they were hot and they were great. But but now they, I, I've just not seen the limiteds do just they're just not as good anymore. And I like what I like the strategy you're employing, you know, getting the best going to the best farms, getting some of the best tobacco there. I think that's the way to do it. I think you, you're, you're spot on there um, with that. I mean, it's, it's kind of clicking with me and giving me this aha moment here. It is. It's. It's. I realized that as an I'm being up front. I'm putting my yeah. heart out there. I'm letting you yeah. know. It was hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember the small batch reserve. Yeah. Yeah. That's one I would say. Great cigar. Great cigar in the beginning, and then I'm being up front. Towards the end, it was. Eh. <laughs> I'm, <being laughs> front of it. I'm the one who made it. I'm it wasn't the same. It. No, I'm gonna be. It wasn't. <laughs> oh, you're right. <laughs> you know, it was green. I'm being up front. It was the tobacco ran out. Yeah. But it was called small batch reserve. <laughs> you yep. know, but, and I would fight. I was smart fight, and a retail customer would come to me and say, "Hey, you know, I can't get these small batch like da 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 lanceros, the like fundadores. Like you only can give me like X amount. I was like it's called small batch, yeah, mm-hmm. for a reason. And then like I was pressured to like just produce it, but I knew in my heart it was not going to taste the same. You know, yeah. I just decided I'm being on front with you two years ago." just to draw the line, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's about quality instead of a quantity. I'm saying it's, it's right. about providing a consistent product day after day after day after day. And you know what made me realize that? When I started selling in Europe and I started with one line, a Criollito. I started with 1870, but when I started doing Criollito, it was simple blend, just yeah. Criollo 98. And 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 for you in San Andres and and a Rosado wrapper. That's it. We just started with that. 
And I just realized, and it started growing and growing and growing and growing. Not complex, not crazy. We just did it, you know, simple, cycle ligero, simple. And it's like, damn, everybody just likes it, likes it, likes it. They smoke it, they want it. It's good, consistent. Like, yep. They didn't even care if the rapper was like, eh, you know, so because it was a valley cigar, but they just want the people liked it. People yeah. can sit, and you see if you go online, people create you to create you to go online for Europe. Create you is my number one sitting cigar in Europe. I, mean, I just shipped 150,000 cigars to to wow. to, to, uh, to Holland just right. now. And I was like, I'm out of boxes. I send it to me in bundles because we're doing plain, <laughs> uh, plain packaging. We're just going to slap an ugly label on it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I realize I'm like, oh my God, what was I doing? Yeah. yeah. Get good tobacco, consistent, and just provide it day after day after day and people are going to smoke it. I drew the line. I decided to just read and I pulled back took everything off out of market and COVID really made me decide, made me like start from scratch. And I started weeding out the bad rollers and all that stuff and better and really training new kids and all that stuff. And I just said, okay, this is my technique. This is my style. This is what I'm going to do. Right. And we're just going to work with these tobaccos and that's it. And if I have every, every cigar of mine, it's going to taste different, but it's going to be consistent. And I and I went to everyone. You're gonna have that all the time. You're gonna have like today. Like I went to to um, I was looking at uh, binders, and it's a binder I use. And the guy's like, "Oh yeah, well, I want you to use this one because we're you know we're gonna start running out." And I go, "Oh, oh, oh. what were you talking about?" It's like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, you can switch. It's alright. It's only binders." Like, eh, eh. <laughs> no. Good for you, Abe. Good for you. Yeah. It was like, uh, when you're getting when you're gonna have the other ones done. It's like. Well, in like three months. All right. And I told my production man, you know, take that cigar out of the market. It's like once we run out, we stop. It's like, oh, well, do we can switch it to this other binder. It's like people are not consumers in the cigar connoisseur has changed. They've become more of that, like the wine connoisseur. You know, like these guys are like, that's what I see now, a cigar smoker now. It's not, it's not stupid though. They're smart. Yeah. They can tell when something changed now. Yeah. Before, eh, you know, but now, you know, before, you know, you can switch one leaf and whatever and, you know, still sell. No, I'm being unfriendly. I'm putting my, putting it up there. Later on, some people, manufacturers are going to call me and yell at me for saying all this stuff. But <laughs> I'm just telling <laughs> you. Know, we love it. <laughs> you know, but I'm just being upfront with you guys. Like, it's, uh, you know, I'm straightforward. You always know me, but be straightforward. Right. But I'm right. just going to tell you, like, I'm not playing around anymore this is it this is my package this is my box this is a cigar which oh we run out of tobacco oh well, we'll stop but that what but what i did was i reduced my portfolio 1878 three sizes four wrappers remember we used to have like seven sizes yeah sizes. <laughs> that's it um 10th anniversary we launched it again i started doing things little by little yep troubadour we launched it again uh criollito and that's it. Teddy Privado will be the next thing we're going to relaunch, the Rosado, and it will look like this box right here, you know? Oh, very nice. And, and and everything we're doing more like, you know, these type of packaging because you know why? Because we can fulfill these boxes. Can, we can get them done quicker. You know, it's like, see how nice that looks? So that will be the next one coming out, you know? We, and that will be reblended with all, mostly Dominican tobacco. Wow. You know? So... Yeah. We'll still have Nicaragua, but we'll have more Nic Dominican. Um, you know, 10th anniversary. You know, we, we did 10th anniversary, and that's doing, like, phenomenal. Oh, I love that. I love that box. I, I love the yeah. rap-style boxes. Those are my favorite type of boxes. But it's it, it, yeah. I'm, able to, I'm able to get them because the thing is, the whole COVID thing has, has ruined everything everywhere. Right. And production, not just for cigars, production for box making. Where uh, I mean, there's a big shortage in the United States and in lower world for cigars. They're back ordered. And a lot of it is because of packaging, because of boxes. So right. I decided to change it. Nobody, you know, they just want to look pretty. I'm saying that looks pretty, right? <laughs> you know, and look good, eye-catching, and we just changed it. And people are lo loving the way the 1878 Santiago looks, the Criollito, the new packaging. And you know why they like the most? It's consistent. Yeah. They can smoke it now, they can smoke it later, can open another box and consistent. Yeah. So that's the new PDR. And that's the reason why we're now Puros Dominican Republic. 
Wow. So, you know, Abe, uh, again, we could say what we want about the cigar aficionado ratings at the end of the year, whatever you want to say. But, you know, those brands that get on that you were mentioning every year, like Padron, those brands, that's why they land every year. They're consistent. So you get a couple of cigars and maybe you catch their eye and maybe you have a couple of those on there too at some point. So I think this is a very, very smart sound strategy you're doing here. Uh, I like it. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Why do you think Padron is always on in the top 10? Why do you think Fuente is always? Fuente makes a cigar and he lets it sit for three years. You yeah. Know? And the tobacco is already old, you know? Yeah. Padron, the tobacco is like, how? Like five, 10 years old? I mean, yeah. it's like, think about it. There's a reason why. Why you smoke a Padron all the time? Is there a small batch on the Padron? Have you no. ever smoked a small batch Padron? Not really. There's no, no such thing. Not, not really. No I thing. mean, they may come out with a size every few years that's harder to roll, but yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's yeah. that's their new that's their new thing. You know, yeah. what I'm saying? you know. But the, you said it yourself. The small batches now are just hey, you know, no. They're just, just they're just like we get these, and and I, I'm and I don't want to speak for Aaron, but I'm sure I'm speaking for Aaron. We get this, and I'm like, what what are we getting here? This is not <laughs> these are not great cigars we're getting. Um, and uh, it's yeah, it's I I'm totally on board with this because the thing is the game has changed. Yeah, everybody has brought up their game. Yeah, you know, everybody's brought up their game. You know, it's not like the way it was 20 years ago. If you did a really good cigar, you, you grew real quick. You know what I'm saying, but everybody else was saying, eh, so so cigars, you know? Yep. And even the big guys, after this, dude, you know, after this 20 years ago, and I'm and I love those guys, it was okay. You know what I'm saying, right? They even brought up their game. You know? Oh, they definitely, they definitely have brought up their game in the last few years, no doubt. Oh, their game is up, you yeah. know? Yeah, and, and and general cigars bringing up their game. All these guys who were just like Budweiser, now they're becoming small batch. You know what I'm saying like they're becoming Samuel Adams. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's 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 not the same. It's not the way it was, and the consumer has changed a lot, a lot. It's like beer. The consumer has changed a lot, you know, and it's not the same it was. I used to got the guys who drink their Bud Lights. You know what I'm saying, right. but. You know, all these little micro brews are getting bought out for a reason. Yep. You yep. Know? yep. And it's still owned by White <laughs> you, <know? laughs> yeah. you know? Exactly. Exactly. Good point. Good point. Um, hey, they Aaron- bought President thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah. 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 Shit, man. And a lot of people drink President down here. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, Aaron, do you have any questions? I have a couple more others for Abe. Uh, do you have any? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, Abe, I have a few more, and then I have a couple of fun things I want to kind of do. Um, okay. All right. Um, how's your time? Do you need, like, uh, are you strapped? I don't know, bro. Okay. I'm um, good. Okay. I'm in my house. Okay. I won't keep you super late, I promise. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, but I may have to get up and pee for a second. But that's okay. Worry. That's okay. I have a commercial read I got to do in a few, so that's you could go to. You have to well, let me know, then I go and pee, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so on the just last thing is trade show thoughts on the trade show. How did you do with the trade show? Um, future of the trade show for you. I think the trade show was, uh, everybody was well, very receptive to the new local PDR. Yep. Uh, you saw that backdrop with the glowing. Yep. Every, and we, and we left the glowing. We were the only ones with the glowing, you know, back, uh, uh, backdrops. And then at the party, everybody was like coming to, it's like, is that you? It's like with that monument. So, <laughs> Um, it came yeah. out great, you know. Uh, it did. It really. It, it was a smaller. I mean, I remember the white couches in your booth. I love those white couches. Yeah. They were comfortable. But it, I liked. I liked the backdrop for sure. I, I think uh, I spent a lot less and made more profit and more money than since 2017. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying so. Yeah. I not a lot of people went, uh, but the people went bought. I think. If we stick to the way I felt like the show was like RTDA 2002, 2004, you know what I'm saying? Like 2004 right. around the way we were like, everybody was small. Remember like, I don't know if you ever remember like the flavor rats were all like, you know, CAO had like four boobs going straight down. They had like mm-hmm. a flavor red booth and they had, you know, and everybody was like small boobs. Nobody had these huge boobs back then, you know? No. Remember everybody had like, you know, even the big CEO, say CAO had like, you know, they had like a, a, a booth. They had like five booths. Let's say four booths. 
they had a, a booth with the flavorettes they, and it was 10 by 10 and they had another booth next to each other it was like the sopranos and there were another booth you know and then they had one booth with like you know where they have meeting people and, it, and that's what i felt it was like back then like you know nashville like you know i think it was like 2004 nashville like yeah. 2005 but like i felt we were getting back to those times times the traffic was not as big like those times but i think we're getting back to that simplicity um Am I going to do it again? Yes. Um, but I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to be the PDR from 2014, 15, where we had 52 booths like we used to do. Yeah. Um, I don't think a lot of people, well, even Perdomo, uh, Perdomo. He cut had back like a lot. Booths. Yeah. Six booths, I think yeah. he had. You know, AJ had four booths, Island. Most people had four booths, Islands. That's what we did. So, um, yeah, I'm going. I'm going again. The trade show, we need the trade show, not the trade show itself. We need the, we need PCA. We need an association. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's necessary. Um, we're living in a set in time right now where it's like a boom um, for manufacturing. Uh, catalogs are going crazy. Everybody's buying online. Everybody's smoking. Consumption is crazy. Liquors, liquors is crazy. I mean, I got a friend of mine who looks, works for, for Riccardi and he's telling me like they can't even keep up you know what I'm saying like it's it's uh it's you know you know beer like it, nobody can keep up the consumption rate has gone up through a roof you know um cigarettes has gone up remember cigarettes were going down yep. cigarettes gone up yep cigarettes look at it look for it look at it. the rate the, the 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 report cigarette consumption has gone up I I know, you know two I mean? people stopped smoking cigarettes that started again uh during the pandemic exactly yeah yeah you know? so uh yeah so yeah you're 100 percent right uh, cigarette consumption has gone up vape has gone down cigarette consumption has gone up yeah. I mean, that's what i'm trying to tell you yeah cigarette companies are like oh we love it we thought we were you know we we're gonna be out of business by now no we're making more money than ever yeah everybody's making money i can't even keep up like you know i have back order i have two million cigars on back order. I, I, just for people different not my own brand just people stuff that i make for other people and you know and you know i think it every every industry has an association and our association is pca we need pca to be alive and uh we need a, a we need a group to fight for us tp is great don't get me wrong i like the i like their model yep. in a sense you spend a lot less money but they're not going to fight for us, you know? Um, you know, we sometimes, and, and I used to think about it, oh, you know, PC, you know, our, our TDA PCA is like raping me, you know, stuff. But then I realized, you know, we need we need them to make money because they use that money for to fight against our battles. You know what I'm saying? Because we're not, you know, we don't have the time. That's their job to do that. You know, every NRA, all the gun people have their, their their association even software companies have an association everybody has something yep that's our association if that dies we're dead in the water yeah we're dead in the water we're, they're gonna right now we're okay but just because covid is like right you know u.s government is going insane you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like that's all they're focusing on but once everything goes away you know they're gonna they're coming after us again you know what i'm saying right now everything oh it's la la land and and all these new brands are coming out. And they're like, oh, yeah, nobody's going to go off. They're gonna, if we don't have PCA, oh, they're definitely coming after us right away. We need to have an association. we got to support our association. we gotta, we got to really make sure they're strong, financially strong. And we got to, you know, I'm not going to do anything. Um, we're, we can't lose money either as a manufacturer. we got to make some profit, you know. I think keeping a small, lean, and mean works out. Yeah. But we cannot all back out. I think everybody has to support. I think the retailers have to also support all the all the brands. You know what I'm saying? Because um, we eat from them, and if they're not supporting us, you know, it, it it makes it hard for brands to go to the PCA. You know, and that's another reason why, you know, the last five years I've seen a decline of people going to PCA. Retailers not going um, to PCA, and that what it does is manufacturers start saying, no, I'm not going to go because, or I'm going to keep on not 
I'm, I'm going to go smaller and smaller and smaller and spend less money. And next thing you know, PC has less money and, and they can't do the, the battles that we need to them to do. You know, that's my thought. That's my opinion. You know, I don't want PCA to go away. Um, you know, and, and I'm more stronger, you know, supportive of a PCA now than before. Um, I support them 100%. Um, there's a lot of people who make cigars, even here in the Republic, who are not really putting in their two, you know, they're, you know, putting in, you know, what they need to do to support them, you know, and, um, you know, and I'm going to be honest, I, I even, I, I wasn't supporting for a while because I, you know, I got upset for a few, few times for the show and you know, I got charged, you know, whatever, eight, you know, $15,000 just to, for them to put a freaking hanging sign, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, and I was like, oh my God, that's too much money, you know, and, and, and the drainage and, and things like that. But I think, I think they need to control that type of stuff because, People can't be spending that much money and manufacturers are going to be spending that much money. I think if you're smart, keep it lean and mean and, and still support them in a way where we make profit and the, and the brick and mortar co and buy, um, you know, I, I think we all can, it would be a win-win for everybody. You know, for me, I did a four booth Island. That will be my, my, my space for a long time. Maybe I get up to six again, but I'm not going to go crazy like I used to. So I totally understand. I do miss the white couches, though. Uh, they, they, were, they were always great to sit on, though. So. But no, I, yeah, no, I, I totally hear that as well. The awesome. white couches, was, I mean, I almost did a white couch, but uh, like, I was like, ah. Hey, yeah. I, I, I was smoking on one of those white couches, but I don't think I ever told you the story. And uh, the cigar was going to ash, and I had, like, I just let the ash go on my pants. I said, if this gets on the white couch and burns it, he's going to kill me, right? <laughs> Thing went right on my pants. I was like, I just. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, I mean, yeah, I no. mean, I, that that was that was my thing. The white couches and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, it felt like a lounge all the time. You know, yeah. but the thing, you know, this year I just did like white. I did white chairs and tables. Yeah, they were yeah I did, I really like I really like the backdrop too. I thought it was awesome. I mean, it was it really looked like a lot of booths downscaled, and I wasn't happy with that. But what, what you did, I thought was really nice. I thought, like I said, and people were talking about it um, when we were in the party because you know, mm-hmm. so we a few of us walked actually through the booze to get to the party so we yeah. actually saw that on the way in which was pretty cool so yeah, a lot of people a lot of manufacturers came to me and said where did you get that and like, i gave them and next year you're gonna see a lot of people with those type of pop-ups oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. a lot of people with that, like oh he did a, i'm gonna do my next year we'll be like you know i got the idea from when i was at tpe i went you know i went to like you know the dark side you know going you know <laughs> the cbd the you know but they had and nice booze there. They have nice booze there. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was great. And then yeah. like I saw this this one guy, one group. Oh, it was like all like all four wall. Like it was a booth with like a four by four, and it was back. You know, it was like all four walls. It was all glowing, and they just had like a little entrance. It was like a cube, you know, and it was all glowing everywhere. And I was like, oh my god! And I walk in there. I was like, where did you get this? It's like, and it was so bright, and it was like fluorescent. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying everybody, and they had like you know techno music and like all this shit and everybody's you know smoking something in there i don't know cbd and i was like and i went up to the guy and it's like this looks awesome this is so bright and he's like yeah yeah you know he's like i know we set this up ourselves no, no, no. and we just put all four walls and tables and chairs and that's it and i'm going it's like where did you get this and he gave me the contact and i was like oh man it was that wasn't that much money it was like for the two pop-ups was uh and we put it together ourselves it was like you know 1700 bucks Wow, that's, wow that's great. That's a great, yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna do like I'm gonna keep those two, and then I'm gonna buy two more. And I'm gonna <laughs> keep on like it's gonna be like the cube all glowing. Yeah. You know how I had the banners? Do you yeah. know how I had the banners? I'm gonna yeah. do those same artworks on the on backdrops, and I'm just gonna be all glowing box. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It'll be bright. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Great. Great. And all white, and then I'm gonna do like white white uh, rugs. White rugs and, and oh, then, and, then I'm really gonna white. have to be careful ashing now. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that would be great. All right, Abe, I want to ask you. This is our cattle and cigar steak question of the night. Um, I'm okay. assuming you still eat steak, right? You haven't gone vegan. No, no, I eat meat. I like meat. All right, <laughs> All right. what? I want to know what your favorite cut of steak is. Ribeye. Oh uh, yeah, you go. Yeah. That's mine. Ribeye. That's I mine. like. I like the. I like the just the little fat. You know what I'm saying? 
It's, oh, I mean, if you see what we have a grill, right? I mean, uh, see that grill back there? There you I mean, go. That's a, yeah. that's a that, big, you know, seven thing. I grill all the time. Like, this, is a, this is my new apartment over here, you know, with a balcony. And, nice. You know, that's good for you. Yeah. You know, so. So I bought this big ass grill and I grill it all the time. I like meat. I, I I can't only eat like three ounces, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just like I like ribeye. Yeah. That's the only meat I sometimes T bone, but my thing is ribeye. I yeah, just like yeah. I just like the fat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just like I don't know, just like the way it just like sizzles. You know when the fat is like sizzling on it. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. You know? Oh. Like fillet. Fillet is nice, but it just like the the little the rib, fat. The ribeye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I'm totally on board with you on that one. Yeah, I mean that's you know that's part of the reason I got so fat, you know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> well, I know, and uh, believe me, I know. <laughs> but well, you you kept your is, weight up. You kept your weight up a long time, Abe. Good for you. Yeah, it's been like now almost five years now. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, nice. Yeah, you know, I drink a lot now, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I've drank like many beers now. I think I've drank already with you guys <laughs> like five beers. You know, I'm drinking. I'm drinking these big ones too. This. Yeah. This is a this is a German beer called Five Point Zero. You know, it's like pretty good. It's nice. pretty strong. Nice. You know, so it makes it up. You know, it's, it's good. Oh wow. Um, yeah, so they started importing it. I think Presses and to feel bad. They needed to have some extra competition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I can't do the Corona. Corona is too light for me. You know, yeah. I need a little. Bit, I need something to give me a buzz. This yeah, is like yeah. eight point eight point something percent alcohol. Okay. So yeah, you know, Presidente beer, like the, the normal one, you know, they say it's five point, but it's not five point. It's it's like seven. You know, uh, okay. uh, the the light is is for pussy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the light the Presidente beer. Uh, all right, Abe. I want to just talk uh, about. <laughs> I want to talk about Aaron, what Aaron and I was smoking tonight. Um, and it's sponsored by Taylor Smoke, located in the heart of downtown Charlotte's Epicenter, and now just outside the Charlotte Motor Speedway, it's Concord, North Carolina. Taylor Smoke is your one shop stop for a Taylor Smoking experience. So, Aaron, you're smoking that uh, that AFR 75 Claro. Yep, smoking the AFR 75. Uh, Cigar is very toasty. Uh, a lot of toasted wood, some toasted hay. Uh, it's got a little bit of earthiness to it, a little bit of black pepper in the background. Uh, but there's also nice creaminess to it. Uh, Retro hell is really smooth. Um, it's got a nice clean finish as well. So it's not like it's not like just sitting on your tongue for the entire time that you're smoking it. So it's nice and it's nice and light in regards to that. Um, I'd say maybe slightly below medium, medium strength, probably somewhere around there, uh, but lots of body to it. So uh, construction is fantastic. So it's smoking well. Yep. That is far, I think we... I mean, you were going to say something, Coop? No, go ahead. Uh, that cigar probably was rolled to like, probably like six, five years ago, five, six yeah. years ago. It's, it's been in my humidor for a while. Yeah, it's been, it's, <laughs> you know, that's been aged, well aged. Yeah. You know, it was already aged by a year and now it's really yeah. aged. Uh, you know, the AFR is a special, remember uh, Coop Taven? Oh, yeah, I know Taven, yep. Okay, so Taven, I remember we came up with this whole AFR thing. We wanted to come up with something limited edition. And, you know, Taven, you know, remember, he's a military guy. Yep. Um, and we wanted to come up with something, you know, my initials, my Dominican name is Abraham Flores Rosario. So AFR. Right. You know, so, and he's like, oh, we got to come up with a name. I don't know. It's like, oh, it's like, you know. And, and I was born in 1975. So he's like, you know, he's like, we should like come up with something like with a gun, like, you know, AR or something, you know? And it's like, he's like, yeah, what about AFR 75? He's like, that sounds like a gun. He's like, yeah, like all big ring gauges and stuff. <laughs> so, and that's how it came up. You know what I'm saying? That whole AFR thing. And remember like they were all, you know, Catador is like 54 by four and a half. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And then, and then, the the sublime and then and then Ed Mundo's, you know, they're 56, 54, and then Immenso's are 58 by seven, you know what I'm saying? So you know, by six, you know, no, by seven, yeah, by seven. And, and and they're not small cigars, you know, they weren't traditional. And it was gonna be like all lacquer and like, you know, with the Cuban pigtail and had that Coiba 
uh, like, right? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. feel to it, you know. Unfortunately, with that, it was just like, uh, again, when we talk about doing these small batch things, it's, it's when we use limited edition tobaccos, you know, from certain farms, and that's all Jalapa and Condega, and 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 I was doing it from these little farms in, in Nicaragua. Um, I would go down, and that's how I met my wife. She is actually a, from Mr. Lee, my new wife. I've been with her now six years. Um, you know, it's been really, the new AFR will be different. I'll let mm-hmm. you know. It's not going to be the same AFR. You're not going to see this AFR that you're smoking now. Um, we're doing more, more, uh, the new AFR is going to be a broadleaf um, or either that or Connecticut, Ecuador, Connecticut hybrid that has like a broadleaf seed with, with Connecticut, you know? Oh, wow. Uh, kind of like that Davidoff Millennium Brown chocolate, you know what I'm saying? Mm, Wrapper. Yeah. That's what's gonna be. Um, I'm I'm gonna probably put a little bit. I got some. If I'm gonna do anything a little special to it, it's gonna be this. I'm gonna have like a half a leaf of one of the what that river from Cuba. That I got like, I got about two, you know, about ten bales of it. So we'll put a little bit of Cuban tobacco in it. So it just like so I have that little tang to it, and then everything else is gonna be Dominican. So that's gonna be the the one that you'll see coming out. Cool. You know, but it won't come out now. It will be out probably. Uh, probably be out. I don't know when I get at least a little bit more rollers to to it. <laughs> you'll see. You'll see the new CVR before the before AFR. The CVR you'll see. You probably seen on Facebook. A couple of people post the CVR, the new CVR, mm-hmm. uh, the, AFR, the the new CVR. It has a the blue band azul and all that stuff. Because I've been selling it a little bit around here, and I've been selling it in Asia, uh, uh, the new uh, the new CVR with the with the brow leaf, um, and only the the Azul, not the Maduro. So I've been doing the belly coaster in China, and and in certain places in Europe. Because, but I only can produce like you know, five thousand cigars at a time. Like that's because right now with the with the production that I have, 1870 is doing phenomenal. Criollito is doing great. Tenth anniversary. You know, I mean, I just, I'm shipping just, just, you know, we did phenomenal. We got reordered with you know, all, all the Casa Monte Cristos that they have all the 10th anniversary. And then for, for, for Holland and uh, Belgium and Luxembourg, we just shipped a thousand boxes of this. You know what I'm saying? People just love it. You know, it has a very, very Cuban taste to it, you know? So, and they like the way it tastes. So we're doing phenomenal with that. So, but the problem is I can't increase my production. We're just taking a little bit of time. So we got we got to be very, I don't want to have the, the same issues we were having in the past. Yep. And you know, Coop, like you were, you were friends with our retailers. What the issue, the issue we had like in 2015, 16, it was back orders. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. People yep. was like, oh, oh yeah. PDR is great, but they're always on back order. It was always on back order because it was, we grew so fast. And we were selling to everybody. We were making cigars for everybody. And we had so much commitment. Now we're about PDR. You know, PDR number one, we, we even with, with Gurkha, we reduce our portfolio to three lines and that's it, you know, and that's it. And I'm not really doing much with catalogs either, anymore either because we don't just, we don't have the production. You know, the only one I still produce is Obsidian. And even that, I'm not even doing much, a little bit, you know. I'm I'm smoking the Azul. This is from the first batch that you came out with. I think this is five years old. Um, and this is that I love this wrapper, Abe. I love this like Rosado broadleaf wrapper that you put on this, and I love the the original Maduro. But this kind of softens that blend just a bit, and it, it's like this sweet creamy taste you get throughout the whole cigar, and you get all those great broadleaf roots. It's not as rough and rugged as maybe a broadleaf. And I'm telling you, with the age on this cigar, this is smoking unbelievable right now um i'm glad i still have a few more of these left i'm smoking the grand toro size um no, I, have, I have the jar upstairs um in my jar room i have a bunch of jars up there so uh love love the packaging of the cigar um so i'm excited when i'm excited to see the relaunch of this too no the relaunch no i mean the, the zool i like the zool um more than the Maduro, to be honest with you. I think the I, I, I was a Maduro guy, but I've come over to the Azul. Yeah. 
I think there's always more balance. I think it's more creamier. Yeah, it's more exactly. toast, toasted notes. You know, mm-hmm. It's more like it's like a grand cracker. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just more like that yeah. type of taste profile. Yeah, and, and especially after the ages, it's just like it sticks in your mouth. You know what I'm saying? It's just like in there. Yeah. Um, and people ask me, "Oh, what makes it azul?" It's like, no, I just couldn't. I didn't want to call it collateral. I just, you know, I just the yeah. band was blue and I call it azul. But you know, it's like, it, but it's still broadleaf. Like, yes, because if you think broadleaf just comes out black, right? You know what I'm no, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you think know? this habano? If you looked at this, you'd think it's a habano wrapper. Like you would look at yeah. it, yeah. But it's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful wrapper too. It's got a little reddish hue to it, and um, yeah. it's not. It's not black. Yeah, it's not that black. Uh, so I, I like, I mean, this is great. Um, you I think you have great. to process it a lot to get it dark. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you, when you buy, when you buy broadleaf, even San Andres, you're going to get lights and darks. Even yeah. in Habano, you get lights and darks, right? Yeah. So, so you have, when you sort, you have all these lights. Well, what are you going to do? Cook it so you can get it all black? No, I said, I'm going to do it claro. You know what I'm saying? And that's it. So that's what I did with San Andres, with the AFR and the CVR. Mm-hmm. just came out with claro versions of the maduro you know uh and it worked out great people i mean i personally like for this for the afr i like more the claro mm-hmm. you know um for for 1878 more of the maduro you know the maduro for me is really good uh 1878 um for the city privada to be honest with you i'm more of the maduro for the city privada i i am too i'm more on that side too i've always yeah. been on that side yeah yeah, that I would agree with you on that. All right, Abe, I'm gonna do a commercial run, and then I want to do a short, a very short segment on some music stuff. If you if you can, would that be? Oh, right? yeah, that'd be great. Let, All right. How long is this commercial? Uh, take as long as you need. Uh, I can talk, so it usually goes about three minutes. But if you need more time, that's fine. All right, I need two minutes. All, All right, right. <laughs> that's great. So we're gonna go mention a, a word from our sponsors, and I want to first mention JRE Tobacco. The authentic Corolla leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful tobacco leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars in Cuba, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it's one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamasran Valley in Honduras, Julio Oroa took on the challenge of growing Corolla from the original seeds. In 2000, he successfully reintroduced authentic Corolla back to the market. With over 50 years' experience in the tobacco business and growing and curing tobacco, the cigar production, the Jerry Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Corolla. Now with Jerry Tobacco, Julio and his son Justo bring their very own brand to market, each containing the authentic Corolla beef. Aladino is available in a 100% authentic Corolla Puro, San Andreas Maduro, Ecuadorian Connecticut Shade, Cameroon, or Habano Wrapper representing the Golden Age of Scars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retailer. Be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every draw. And by A.J. Fernandez Cigars. A.J. Fernandez's New World brand is named in the honor of the discovery of tobacco by Christopher Columbus's expedition in 1492. Fernandez collaborated with his father Ishmael on the cigar, which is comprised of a wrapper from Nicaragua to covers binder from the Jalapa Valley and a filler blend of Ometepe, Condega, and Esteli tobaccos. The core line debuted in 2014 and it was followed by the New World Connecticut, New World Puro Especial, and New World Cameroon. All four blends are able to captivate the palate of any cigar smoker. If you're beginning to discover the world of fine premium handmade cigars, New World Connecticut's for you. If you're into the rich full body blends, Puro Especial's for you. If you're into the complex flavors, the New World Cameroon's for you. And finally, if you're into the robust and earthy flavors with notes of espresso, the New World Escuro is definitely for you. Visit www.ajfcigars.com dot com to learn more and i uh, want to mention again best cigar prices stock up for those sunny days ahead at the lowest possible prices at your number one source for cigars and accessories bestcigarprices.com they've got the best deals on exactly what you need to fill your long summer days with smoky satisfaction stocking over eight thousand unique items from over 800 top brands best cigar prices is the only online cigar store with a best price guarantee they'll beat any advertised price by ten dollars that's right Visit uh, the Best Cigar Prices is your source for the best summer deals and on the biggest brands and hard-to-find boutiques. Learn more and visit them online at bestcigarprices.com. That's bestcigarprices.com. And we're going to about to head into our Alec Bradley Live True segment. And uh, I'll mention sponsored by Alec Bradley. 500 cigars are set afire in this country every minute. A staggering statistic. 
Wait, that's a good thing. All those folks who relax on a fine cigar. The trouble is a lot of those cigars aren't worth remembering. They're just plain forgettable. That's why you should pick up an Alec Bradley cigar and you'll taste that baby and say, mm-hmm, I'll remember you, Alec Bradley. Learn more at alecbradley.com. Um, so before Abe gets back, Aaron, I'm going to do a couple of just a programming note. We have no show next week, so we will be back on the 9th, the 19th, and uh, we will announce who that guest is sometime between now and then. So uh, no, no primetime show next week, uh, and uh, we will we'll get back on that. Um, and we'll do, be doing primetime jukebox on Monday. Uh, we're doing an uh, Anthony Bourdain playlist. Uh, we're going to have special guests John McTavish and Skip Martin on that show. Um, and it was Skip's idea. With this, he put this Bourdain thing on Dave's lap. So, mm-hmm. uh, so we told him, okay, now you got to come on the show. So, so he will be on, and I know he's already contributed a lot to the, to the content. So mm-hmm. stay tuned on that. Um, well, Abe's coming back, Aaron. Uh, I'm going to make a proclamation here Okay. Um, on baseball. The All Phillies right. have peaked. I don't think they catch. I, I think this is the closest they get the first place. This is going to be it. So um, I just have this feeling. I just have this feeling they're not going to go over the hump and get the first place at this point. I have yeah, I mean, look, I mean, they didn't look. They came back today, but they didn't look good today. They right? didn't look good. Look, they did not look. I was messaging you guys. I'm like, they look like, oh, they just find yeah. ways to try to lose games. And you saw it today. So, I mean, I'm just, they, I know they swept the Nationals. It was an ugly sweep is what I'll just say. <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and the Braves were getting spanked, but they've come back. So they're going to win tonight. Yep. So Ben's, uh, Ben's happy. I know. And, uh, yeah. But yeah, so uh, I'm happy with, as long as we can just stay competitive the rest of the year, I'm happy. So yeah. And we'll go over next year. All right. We got Abe Flores back here. Abe, welcome back here. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> All right. So Abe, I want to talk a little music with you. Um, because here's the thing. I, I know you are, you are a musician, right? Um, I've listened to your music. It's fantastic, right? I saw you, you mentioned it. You played bass over at the Placencia booth, and it was great. Uh, the only instrument I ever tried to play was bass. Like, I'm not saying uh-huh. I was good or anything, but uh, it was, I was at least able to play the instrument, is what I'll just say. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. But uh, and I, love, I love listening to bass. Um, I want to just kind of ask you a few questions here. What are some of the musical genres you're into? Hmm. Jesus, <laughs> I listen to so many different things. Um, back in the day, when I was uh-huh. younger, I was I was like a Red Hot Chili, Red Hot Chili Pepper fan. Oh, and nice, so, nice. Yeah, I was Flea. like all all Flea. That was yeah. that, that was my shit. I, I wanted to be Flea. I wanted mm-hmm. to be the Dominican Flea. <laughs> <laughs> that was my thing. I wanted to be the Dominican Flea. Um, then like Prince. Um, I, my wow. band actually back in the day we opened up for Prince uh, at the Worcester Palladium wow. in Massachusetts. Um, Prince, actually, I still have the bass that, that I played. It was a Music Man Stingray five string that I never sold it because Prince touched it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so I still have that bass. Um, I played uh, at Mama Ken's in Boston in, in Fenway. Mama Kim's was a it was a bar that Aerosmith used to manage and own, so um, I was very big into like Aerosmith and uh, Boston and uh, uh, I mean, in my time we had bands like uh, Ben Scalabim and uh, Mighty Mighty Boston's and and Led Us to Cleo and Buffalo Tom and Lemonheads and. You know, these are the bands we I grew up with and I played with back when I was in Boston. You know, so um, you probably didn't know some of those names. I knew the Maybe, Boston. I knew the Boston. We opened up for the Boston's at the at the Middle East. I mean, wow. if you go to Newberry Comics, Newberry Comics, you probably still find live at the Middle East CDs of me and my band back, oh, wow. in, back in the days, back in ninety and ninety four. Um. 95 the band that i had back then so so that's pretty much the genre i grew up with They're like my my music that we all were in this click that we all played with at the time um you know what i listen now is actually it's funny i'm i, I don't i'm pretty much listening to a lot of like 
God, I don't know. I, I think I'm sticking more towards to what I used to, you two and police and and um, Elvis Costello, uh, uh, Radiohead, uh, Led Zeppelin. I, I have different things on my 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 profile, my my playlist. You know, um, God. Uh, Pixies, I don't know if you remember those guys. Yeah, the Pixies were a great band from Boston. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, Rolling Stones, you know, a few songs from Rolling Stones. Um, your your music is very bass player. Yeah, we're aligned a lot. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up like, you know, I, I, I'm 95, I'm 45 years old. You know, it was not like the hair band shit. You know what I'm saying like, yeah. we were really like, hey, don't get me wrong. I like a few songs from like, you know, Guns N' Roses. You know what I'm saying? But like, and that was really that, that, that cheesy, you know what I'm saying, back then. You know, um, but like some of the hair band stuff, I, that was not me. You know what I'm saying? I was more like, the, the 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 late you know early early 90s stuff you know what i'm saying not that you know and then we got into grunge like you know uh, you know pearl jam like that was big for me uh i was when when 10 came out that's like yeah i wanted to move to seattle <laughs> like when 10 came <laughs> yeah. out i was like yeah i'm moving to seattle i was like that's that's the music i want to play from now on you know what i'm saying like that when 10 came out i was like i'm moving to seattle my mom's like yeah Seattle, Washington. It's like, I don't know. So. It's like, other, it's out of the map. He's like, you're not going down. Oh, no, you're not going over there. It's too far away. It's like, it's like I'm going over to Seattle, Seattle, Washington. I'm going to play bass and grow, grow my hair. Yeah. You know, I had a grunge. You know, I'm going to be the first Dominican, you know, grunge. He's like, no, 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 you're not. No, 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 no. So, you know, uh, you know, that and, uh, I was not really that big into like Sound Garden. I think Sound Garden was very had a couple of good songs. Um, Nirvana I was somewhat into, but mostly I think Pearl Jam was like my band. Like Ten yeah. was like my, my album. It's a great. Like I was that, just gonna ask you about an album, and yes, that's a great album. To me, there's two albums: Joshua Tree and 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 uh, Pearl Jam Ten. Yeah, that's like the two albums for me that were like. The, that's my thing that like yeah. those were my albums you know the joshua tree like would have without you and and um you know uh you two was like my band like that was the boston band that was the band like you know i went to see it fucking you know the great woods and fucking i, I went to see i i think i, I mean the, the gillette stadium and and uh you know fucking before the, the the garden, you know what I'm saying? Like I went, yeah. I saw every U2 fucking concert. I was there in Boston. I was there. I didn't give a fuck who. I didn't have the money. I sold it. I don't give. A, I I went. <laughs> you know, I was a U2 fan. And then I was at Pearl Jam concert at the at the at the garden, right when Kirk Cobain died. And like you know, uh, you know Eddie Vedder came out and it's like oh, and it was like yeah. I was you know that was that was like I was at, I was at that concert, yeah. you know. So that and. That's the bands that you grew up with, like REM a little bit. Um, that, those are my times. Um, I was not really big with other than that. I mean, yeah, I love jazz music. I mean, I, um, you know, like guys like Ron Carter on bass, you know, um, you know, Miles Davis, things like that. But that's more like, that's more like, that's getting geek, you know what I'm saying? Like get, getting really like, you know, technique and stuff. But for me, for play out for music, like what I can relax and I just like, you know, you know, when you put black on, you know, you can just like, you know, sheets of empty canvas and you just like, chill, you know, put the lights down, you can smoke a cigar and you're just like, eh. you know, that, that's, that's what I grew up with. Yeah. And that's me. Yeah. By the way, Carlito yeah. Fuente, he just says hugs from Boston. I guess he's up in Boston. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I, think his son, I think his son goes. Yeah, I think his son goes to college there. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, yeah. That's a. Uh, but uh, 
Yeah, um, you mentioned um, you too. I mean, you were young when Joshua Tree came out, though, because I was in college when it came out. So you had to be like 12 years old, 11 to 12 when that album came out. So that, it had to make an impact on you early. No, it, it, it was – what I'm telling you with you too was mostly when I got into the United States and I was like 13, 14 years old, I was dating this girl, and uh, she was older than me. And she played you too, and she played with or without you. And um, and then that was like my band, like that, you know, you know when I edge the edge and stuff like that, and then like you know, uh, you know, and then before that the other album like New Year's Day, dun, 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 dun. oh yeah, oh, New Year's Day, like that was the first baseline that I learned. You know what I'm saying? Like that, yeah. that, that was like the first baseline I had to yeah. learn. Adam Clayton, you know? yeah, Adam Clayton, yeah, <laughs> New Year's Day, and then um. A little without you was like four notes, but I like you know that was one of the first lines I learned. So I really like really dug into like B two and and um, um, what was another band I was really I don't know I was pretty much really into you two and somewhat the police. Um, I don't know. It's like all into that. I really was not really big into anything else. Like pop music really was like. Eh. To me, you know, yeah, like it was just nothing, nothing special with pop music. Yeah, I me, mean, I mean, Prince was badass. I mean, you can't, you, you may not like Prince, but he was to watch Prince live, he was fucking phenomenal. It yeah. was, I, I got to go to one of his shows in Vegas at the 3121 club he was doing at the Rio. Mm. Um, and it was a very small concert, like, and I, I, I had to really pull, I had to pull a favor in to get a ticket for that. Um, and it was the I, I would say it's, it has to rank as one of my best concerts I ever went to. It was a very mm-hmm. intimate setting, and uh, he was doing more of his new newer stuff. He wasn't doing like a bunch of Purple Rain stuff, but it was still just, what year? Um, two thousand six. So he was doing the 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 uh, diamonds yeah. and pearl. Uh, diamonds uh, and pearl. It was it was pearl, a, diamonds and pearl. Yeah, it was that mm-hmm. new. It was a new power generation band he had. Yeah, new power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was doing yeah, diamonds, diamonds and pearls. Was was like nine. Was nine. Mid nineties, right, right? But it was that band. He started okay, with that I band. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. He Diamond said, of Pearl was like ninety three. Yeah, but it was. Yeah, he, he, said, he had that he band. Yeah, band for yeah, for a long time. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah, and that. Yeah, he was still playing that stuff. He wasn't really like changing it up for a while. Yeah, remember he fought with the label. Yeah, so he he was not doing. He was just doing stuff from that album because that was the mm-hmm. label that he came. Remember, he he had to change those of the label, you know. So yeah, he had a huge. I mean, that was a huge battle he had, uh, and stuff. Uh, and so they gave him his publishing back. They gave and him. Then, his then, yeah. then at the end, he started doing all this stuff from new pop, from you know, yeah. Purple Rain, and you know, oh my God, what's that song on? Yeah. Yeah, I just got his new case. Bo- yeah. What you got? I just got his new box set that came out this summer, and uh, there's a video, and he's got there's a concert he was doing um, from L.A. at the uh, what was it? Well, you know, it's your cigar. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. He did it at the Forum. I'm sorry, he did it at the Forum. Uh, it wasn't the Trovador. Um, and he, he <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the Trovador. It was it was it was Engel because he did uh. He did a version of Hollywood Swinging by Cool and the Gang called uh, Inglewood Swing. Mm. And it was really mm. cool to see him kind of get into that funk vibe on that. And that's on the, the video of the box set there. Yeah. That came I mean, out. Prince is a phenomenal musician. Yeah. He was a drummer. He was a guitar player. He was a yeah. bass player. He was, I mean, yeah. He excelled in every instrument. Yeah. Every instrument he excelled. Every instrument he was, he was killing it. Yeah. So. He was, yeah, he really was. You know, growing up, I was like I said, when I was a little older than you, Prince and Michael Jackson, it was this rivalry in the 80s. Like, you were on the Michael <laughs> Jackson side and the Prince side, and it was kind of it, it was very interesting uh, growing up in my, my house, yeah, with that. Michael was don't get me wrong, I respect Michael Jackson. Yeah. He's he's a phenomenal right. producer, you know, and he's a phenomenal singer. I respect but I think as a musician, Prince yeah Jackson, well ass. it was my dad used to drive michael jackson's manager frank DeLeo. Oh. um oh. yeah he did but he drove michael a few times 
Uh, so he got to know Michael. Michael, I think I told you, so he liked Michael. He always thought Michael was a good guy. He always treated him well. He thought Michael had issues. This was like when Michael was about 20. But <laughs> but what happened is I became a – I was the only one in my house who was a Prince fan over the over Michael. So I was kind of like the rebel. So I thought Prince was better for all the reasons you just said. So, oh. uh, yeah, so it was like – I was like uh, – like you know, I my my sister, mom, and dad always ganged up on me on that. So and the thing is, Michael was a great. He was he he can understand music and stuff like that. And he was a great pop singer. Yeah, he was. Yeah, but he was. Prince, Prince, Prince did everything. Yeah, you know I'm saying like he was he was fucking he did everything and he can play as well as any musician. You know, you know yeah. uh, Marcus Miller. I mean, he can fucking slap just like Marcus Miller. I mean, yeah. he the guy was phenomenal in every instrument. Yeah. When he grabbed my bass when we were at the Wilson Palladium, he's like, hey, let me see your bass. And it was just, I like, gave it to him. And you go, blah, 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 blah. And just like, oh, oh, wow. right there. That's, amazing. Going, that, that's amazing. Uh, that was, was like, amazing. this is good bass. I'm going, yeah. oh. And I'm like, thank yeah. you. I was like, I'm never going to sell this bass in my life. And I just <laughs> like, like, this, this bass will be with me until I die. I'm going to give this to my daughter. <laughs> my I don't kids. blame you. I don't blame you. you. Know yeah. But I mean, Prince for me is, is phenomenal. Uh, another band. I think, uh, oh, man, there's so many. Oh, the music has changed so much now. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, I like Mumford and Sons. I, I like them. They're, Mumford and Sons a pretty good band I can listen to. Remember the guys from, uh, oh, God, Kings of Leon? Yeah. That was a good band. Like, they broke up. I, I, I was feeling like that, that vibe was coming back again. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then they, they broke up. And um, the, I had, like, a little – I thought they were going to be, like, the next thing. And then, and then they, you know, yeah. decided to break up. Um, but, like, I don't see any any bands like that like, anymore. Like, what's, what the fuck is happening? Dude? No, it's I mean like... – it, it's, uh, you know, I think we're going to see some bands emerge in the next few years because in the pandemic, there's been a lot of creativity. So I'm hoping that something yeah. comes out of it. But uh, I mean, I, I thought it was going to be Arcade Fire. And I think they even fizzled out in, in the last few years. So I don't think they have the they, they're not doing the quality that they were doing 10 years ago. So um, no. I think something will uh, I think out of the pandemic, we'll see something emerge. It's just I don't know when that's going to occur yet. The thing that's is, right. rock bands rock rock bands or bands band bands because you're it's you maybe get one or two guys but you'll see all these like single pop guys or you know track guys guys who just do tracks and things yeah two times of those guys coming out left and right i see rappers coming out left and right left and right coming out yeah popping up on my 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 instagram all that stuff and i see like out of 20 RB and rappers and things like that and whatever, even Spanish reggaeton and shit like that. Maybe I see like one band band. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I'm yep. going, what the what the hell is happening? Like what <laughs> I was talking with my my guitar player. I was talking with actually my drummer from my first band. He works for Shore. He's a he's a he's a regional manager for for Shore Mics and up in Massachusetts. And I'm like, dude, what's happening? And he's like, dude. People are buying. People are like, people are buying music, but like the music business is like, it's like, you know, even even Spotify, um, you have to be Drake to make money. Yep. Yeah. And, and you're but gonna not, start. Yeah, you're right. We've talked about that on music. We're gonna start to see the streaming services start to go to war. So you're gonna see a lot of. It's not gonna be everything on every money streaming service anymore. You're gonna see a lot of exclusives now start to come to this. So. Um, because they're not making money. They're not making they're money. Not making... Exactly. I mean, it's they're good money. for it's good for you know if you want to have a great music library as a collector to have this, but but yeah, that I I don't see how they can continue on that route. You're you're 100 right. When you see when you see guys like when you see artists like Britney Spears crying that she's like has no money. Why? Yeah. How the hell Britney Spears has no money? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, you're how? right. How? How? It's just, how? It, how? Explain to me this. Explain. There's no way. Back in the day, she would have retired. She would have been so loaded. It was, it was, yep. But yep. now, explain to me yep. how a girl who, if it would have been back in it, back like you know, 1960, 70, would have been. She would have made so much money. It wasn't. It wouldn't be even funny because I remember how it was because I was signed on the Capitol Records. They they drew up a, a CD. Mm -hmm. and they went like this: We take X amount of percentage of the pie. You take this pie, and this is your pie for the manager. And this is so we made oh 25% of the pie. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah. Not anymore. They make 0. 0.002 of the of what's being streamed. That's what they make. They don't make no money at yeah. all. Mm-hmm. At all. I know the guys from Mighty, the singer from Mighty Mighty Boston. Oh, for example, The Roots. You know The Roots? Yeah. Quest Love. I know Quest Love. I lived in Philly. I played with him. I did. I had, when he took the residency with, with Jimmy with, with Jimmy Fallon, um, Kimball, or Fallon, right? Um, I asked him, why you guys did that? It's like, dude. Paycheck. St- it, it paycheck. <laughs> and they pay. <laughs> and we're making like millions of dollars, you know, straight up. Yeah. He's like, what, 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 what? It's like, no, we're making almost no money from streaming. I'm like, very little. And we have to be gigging all the time. We're getting old and tired. You know what I'm saying? To, we make more money from gigging, from playing tours. And then now with the pandemic, when died, yeah. that little money that these guys were making money, it's gone. Like, they, they're suffering. I know bands who were regional signed bands who were like, you know, going bankrupt, you yeah. know? You know? Yeah. Even, even the older guys, right? Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, they just signed these massive, they sold their catalogs. Yeah, because they wanted to cash yeah. in now. I mean, exactly, that's exactly what's happening. So yeah, I, I guess we've been talking a lot about this on the music show. We're going to see a lot of changes in the next five to ten years because it they can't have, go on like this. They can't go on like this. People are selling the catalogs because they're making no money. Yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, before publishing was the where where you made money. Uh-huh. Look at the documentary with Paul McCartney. He talked about the the the, the catalog, uh, the Beatles catalog. And that Michael Jackson fucked him. I'm saying, and he said, "Oh yeah, that's where." You, and he told Michael. Michael asked him, "Where should I invest money at?" And he's like, "Catalog publishing." And he went and bought Michael his. Bought, uh, and he bought his. You yeah. <laughs> and they made money. Yeah. Now, they don't make no money. Uh huh. They make no money. Yeah. Tell me how the how the hell the Beatles are not making money. They should you know be. Saying? They should be billionaires. Yeah. Yeah, they should yeah. be. It should be a billion dollars coming in. Every, they, uh, every year at least for the yeah. Beatles they're not yeah. they're not making money yeah you know what I'm saying they're, because nobody listens to the Beatles as much yeah. as they used to to be honest with you, you know that no you know I know that and, I know that yeah we know that and, I mean, see, the, and see these aren't being sold anymore no it's true uh, like I said it's um, we, we've, we're seeing a lot of it uh, so it's kind of sad in a lot of ways um, um, to see that happen classic but. rock Classic rock was still being uh, all the way up to like 94, 95 bands who were the Beatles, Rolling Stones, uh, uh, Grateful, you know, Grateful Dead had, had a good following. Um, uh, bands like, um, I mean, Grateful Dead, they made money just on tours and, and selling yeah. CDs at the fucking events. You know, yeah. what I'm saying? you know, the guys fish. Fish, fish. We used to open up for the Grateful Dead. Yeah. I remember talking to those guys. They're like, "We don't fucking need a label. We just fucking sell our shit. We make money." They do. Yeah. Like, I'm you a fish. I, I listen to a lot of fish. I've been to fish concerts. Yep. They, they're not really studio. They make their money on the live albums. In the live album, that's where yep. they made they, most they, of the money because they, they the like, library out there. Yep. yep. Cut the middleman. Cut the label. They pay us directly. That's yep. that's how they made yep. their money. They're not millionaires, but they live no. well for, well enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And no, they I made agree. it from there. But it's not like they're making it from streaming. You know what I'm saying no, it's no, definitely not. not, definitely not, definitely not. And that, and that, and that, that culture, that the younger people now, or the people who are now into the music that's coming out, they're not listening to Bob Dylan. You know what I'm saying they're not listening to, you know, even 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 you know Bob Marley. They're not even listening to the stuff that 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 people, we used to listen to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And 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 they just listen to the crap that's coming out. And what? Why you think freaking uh, uh, Justin Bieber is still hot? They yeah. still making you know Justin doesn't have to do shit. How many tours Justin Bieber does? How many of it? He does one every couple a uh, couple yep. years, and he makes money. You know why? He has that following. And what does he do? You know what I'm saying nothing. You know <laughs> nothing. Yeah. You know, right. and then right. you see the f- fucking poor fucking guys from Rolling Stone busting their ass up. <laughs> and in the know, 80s, got, got close pushing 80, having a tour. <laughs> having to tour. And this this dude who's fucking 20 something does one, a couple of events, charges a, a bunch of fucking money in Las Vegas. And that's it. Oh, I'm done. I'm chilling. That's it. And, yeah. you know, th- think about it. It's, yeah. it's, I'm, it's sickening. As a musician, I'm like, oh my God, what happened? What happened here? You know? Yeah. You know, I'm complete. I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I no, don't this, know is great. this is great. This is great. All right. All right. 
No, it's good stuff, Abe. Abe, uh, we're going to get to the end here. So I want to thank you very, very much for being on the show tonight. Um, well, thank you for having me. I yeah, mean, I can great. talk all night about flashing the music industry. I can talk it all I'll get, I'll get you on the music show. Seriously, we do music and cigars. I, I'll, I'll get you on that dude, one. I bash the music. I'm so fucking... I went to Nam and I'm just like, you know, I used to go to Nam. I'm like, oh, I love Nam. And, you know, like back in the day when I was young, Nam used to be like the piece, you know, the RTDA for me. Like when I used to go when I was young, oh, Nam. And I'm just like, eh, you know, it's like, fuck, you know. Nam is going through the same shit that, that PCA, uh, PDR, uh, uh, PCA went through. Interesting. Yeah. 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 A lot of issues, a lot of stuff, you know, no, nobody's really making money. You know, I mean, how how the hell, you know, Fender and Gibson go almost out of business? I mean, like all these yep. things are happening all the time, you know, and, you know, it, it, I mean, a Fender guitar used to be a great guitar, you know? Yeah. Um, now it's, eh, you know, and, and you got these little small batch, like I'm in, I'm going to be off. I mean, you've heard of uh, Michael Tobias, Tobias bass. Mm hmm. Okay, and he not he sold his Tobias line to yep. Gibson, and then he came out with MTV bass, like on Tobias. If you go on his website, I'm I'm endorsed by MTV bass. I'm one of the the Dominicans. I'm the only Dominican endorsed by MTV bass, you know, as a musician. For Dara basses, you know what I'm saying? I'm the only Dominican endorsed by Fordera bass. I'm the, you see on their website, you know, Fordera. You know I'm saying they have me as as a musician for their musician. You know, so, you know, these guys are, they're not going to last. You know what I'm saying? And they, and they, and they're, you know, and they're, and they come in with, it's like, they come in with quality instruments, you know, but they're not going to last that long. You know, eventually they're just going to die out, you know, and same thing, it's, you know, what's going to happen with the cigar industry. It's, you know, we got to either stick together or we're going to fall apart, yeah. you know? So we got to stick together. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Abe, thank oh. you so much again for being a guest tonight. No, thank you for having me. Yeah, put me on, put me, put me on the music show. I'll bash the whole music. Oh, that, they, Dave, Dave will definitely <laughs> want as well. We'll get you on that for sure. So I'll talk to you about that for the fall. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Uh, it's been a pleasure, guys. Let, anything else? Let me know. Thank you for having me for the show, and uh, thank you for supporting me from day one. And uh, hopefully, I'll see you soon. I hope Come so. Come down, take yeah. a we're yeah. having Pro Cigar again this year. I'm planning on going yeah. unless something changes, like they quarantine me. But uh, yeah, no, no, no. We're, we're all wide open now. Everything is open. Uh, okay. Now. Here's Everything... the here's things are getting messy, so that's why I'm getting concerned. But we'll see. Well, it's it's you got that Delta thing virus, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, we, we can't keep on closing the economy. We no, gotta, we can't. We we, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. No. Yeah, I totally agree. All right, Abe. All take right. care. And uh, thank you, guys. Stay safe. Right, thanks, Dave. See you soon. See you guys soon. All Thank right. you for having me. Have a All great right. night. You Ciao. too. Bye-bye. That is the one and only Abe Flores of uh, PDR Cigars. Um, so, Aaron, uh, yeah, uh, let's get into right into our Soprano segment here tonight. Okay. Um, I picked something that I knew you you, you know quite. Uh, you may actually know this topic or this character better than me. It was Beach Glamana. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, <coughs> he was one of my <coughs> – excuse me. He was one of my favorite characters. Um, yeah. And um, he was only on for like four or five episodes, though. But mm -hmm. I just thought he was fantastic as a character. Mm -hmm. um, Aaron, I know, I'll know i put you on the spot. You, you may know. I can explain the background. If not, the background of Feech, if folks may not remember who he is. Yeah, so Feech uh, was an old timer. Uh, I would say he's probably in the same age range as uh, Tony's dad and Uncle Junior. Yeah. But he came over from he – was, he was made in Sicily. Yeah. And came over. So they called him a mustache because, you know, he was from from the other side. But, uh, you know, he was into gambling. You know, he ran gambling and, and numbers and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there, that's what uh, I'm arrested, you know, right? That's why I'm arrested. Yeah. 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 But um, one of the big things of kind of went way back in the show was uh, Tony had stuck up one of his card games. Yeah. Right. And uh, then um, I think it was Richie April kind of stepped in for him to try, you know, try to like get him a pass. Right. Right. So uh, that's kind of how their relationship kind of got off on a, a bit of a sour note. 
And uh, so Feech, I think he got, what did he get, like 20 years or something he like that 20, initially? He got 20 years because he came out after 20 years. Yeah, so he was in for 20 years. He comes out. Uh, he meets with Tony. And I don't remember who else he met with, but he wanted to get back into things, right? Yeah, he had that lunch with uh, Junior, Uncle Junior, Tony. I think Bobby was in that lunch, too. Okay. Yeah. So he wanted to kind of get back in, you know, get back in and, you know, get the blessing and all that yeah. stuff. And so that, you know, they just said, you know, Things have changed since you've been away. Just take it easy. Don't step on anybody's toes and all that stuff. And he did exactly what he was told not to do was step on people's toes. So right. uh, he had a little dust up with uh, Polly about some landscaping stuff. Oh, that's classic. And uh, guys knocking the guys out of the trees. He hit up the the doctor's uh, like daughter's wedding and stole a bunch of cars from all the guests and yeah. stuff like that. And Tony had already told him that. Uh, Dr. Ira was off limits, so that kind of got you know. He so stole they, the cars, uh, right? He stole the cars. Yeah, they from stole the, the cars. <laughs> the the cars. <laughs> yeah. So you know, a bunch of Porsches and Mercedes and whatever else was in the parking lot, but uh, yeah, so that kind of uh, pissed Tony off uh, quite a bit, and uh, it was it was funny because you know he didn't step down from Tony when Tony kind of confronted him about it, right? No, he didn't. He's like, you know, he, you know, he kind of like asked him like you know do we have do we have a problem or is everything okay and tony kind of plays it off like everything's okay but you know him and uh uh silvio you know are kind of talking about you know what how they want to deal with it or whatever and uh it's unfortunate how it turned out but basically i guess uh christopher and somebody else uh you know played a role where they could see if they could park a truck with a bunch of stolen tvs in his garage at the house he was staying at and then he agreed and then uh you know, the, uh, they sent, they sent over a probation officer and the probation officer found it. And then back, right back to the pen goes, goes they, show him on the, they show him on the bus going back at the end. That's and, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, the, the whole thing that was interesting about that and eventually it came out like, um, Tony had a similar thing with Richie April getting out of prison right. and Richie, Richie gave him fits. Right. And, I kind of sensed as that was going on, this was going to be another Richie April scenario, but you yeah. had this, an older guy, even maybe more hard nosed in a lot of ways than Richie. Uh, maybe not as Richie could be really cruel, but, 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 um, but Feach was hardcore. And then Tony finally just, I remember he says, I'm not going through this Richie April shit again or something yep. like that. Yep. And uh, that's when, that's when I think he, uh, Tony just basically sent uh, Christopher to kind of take care of that problem. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, I really like the character. Like, uh, I really I thought that if they if it w- if they wouldn't have had that tension, and he could have really been an ally to Tony, like it could have been like, like this could have been like the the top guy in the show in regards to like, oh, you know, yeah. taking care of business kind of thing. Oh, uh, I, even though even though he was old, right? You know, he was he had a presence and he got stuff done. So, yeah, yeah. um, the character was played by Robert Loggia. Uh, I think Robert Loggia was brilliant in this role yes um you know and uh robert Rogge, i think has passed away because he right yeah because i was i would have loved to have seen him on talking sopranos yeah. um but yeah i mean it was just uh i thought it was a, i thought we were gonna see and it was season five i thought feature was gonna be i thought they were gonna somehow integrate him with the whole new york storyline and stuff i right. thought there was a lot and then i was it, they kind of ended it really fast abruptly like you know, yeah. the, the TV thing happens and he's going off to prison and you never hear or see from him again. I'm like, yeah, that was something that was missing from, you know, I thought it was a missed opportunity there. Um, for sure. I'm hoping he's in. The, I don't I didn't see him a feature character in the prequel. So I don't know if he's in the prequel. You would now. think that there, there would be a spot for him. Yeah. But, you know, I get the impression there's going to be. A, I mean, if this is a hit, there'll be a couple of prequel movies. So mm. maybe they're not trying to just do everything in the first movie. But uh but yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. I think that that character to me, uh, I would put him up there as the, one of the best minor characters on that show, uh, period. Just yeah, because, you know, Logia, you kind of know like, early on from Scarface, right? Yeah. But I thought he played a very weak, you know, he, he acted well, but the yeah. character he played was not a strong yeah. uh, character. He was kind of like a, I don't know, what would you call him, like a middle, a middling kind of like yeah. Drug, you know, drug trafficker kind yeah. of guy. Yeah. Didn't have big balls. He had other guys 
do stuff for him. Um, but I was, it was nice to see him play this role where it was like, like he really had carried the weight. So uh, I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Good character for folks who are maybe newer to the Sopranos. Cause we do get, I do get folks saying they're newer to the show. Um, watching it season five, beginning of yep. season five, the first few episodes, you'll get to see the character of Fichu Lamana if you haven't seen it. Uh, it's de- I, I'm a, I think season five was in my, one of my favorite seasons from start to finish. Uh, yeah. That's also the time when Tony was separated from Carmela. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's pretty, some pretty cool scenes uh, that whole year. I thought was pretty cool. So definitely check that one out for sure. I think one of the saddest things, was, I think when, I think when Christopher came over to the house, Feach asked him if he wanted some peaches or something like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and he yeah. got picked from the tree in the backyard. I was like, this guy's, for, this guy's being nice to you, and you're just going to fucking send him back to jail for the rest of his life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, at least he went back to jail. Christopher's fate was a little, well, we won't give it, I won't give it to yeah, him. Yeah, Christopher had yeah. a much tougher fate. I love <laughs> right. Say. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, good one. Yeah, definitely uh, worth, I think there's just some brilliant scenes with him, yep. uh, I like that. I just would have loved to have seen a lot more of, of Robert Loggia in that role. And I would like, I would just like to have seen him and Pauly have right, you know, right, right. This that battle for a while. Yeah. It was to me, that was like, I thought that's what they were building. It was going to be Tony before he, he had the final. I think I figured there'd be a final confrontation with Tony. Right. Yeah. But I figured Pauly would be the perfect guy to have, have like a feud with. Cause didn't Pauly call him like the, the king of breadsticks or something? Like, Cause he owned something a bakery like that, yeah. or something like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, the the other thing that was going on is the whole Tony Blondetto thing was going on that year too. So I mean, yeah. there was a lot going on that year. But Tony was just dealing with that was a year five. Tony he was dealing with a, a breakup of his marriage. Uh, yeah. He was dealing with AJ. He's dealing with uh, now Tony Blondetto coming back into the picture. Feet. Yeah. I mean, that was a tough year for Tony for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, we made for some great stuff there. All right, and that was our Soprano. Anything else on that? No, good. Okay, that was our Sopranos uh, segment here. Uh, so let's go do a, a commercial break. I see Jose Blanco. You just Jose, you just missed Abe. We just finished with Abe. So, <laughs> <laughs> you go back. Why you just he just woke up? <laughs> All right. Uh, let me get into our, uh, our sponsors here. Uh, I want to mention J.C. Newman Cigar Company. Founded in 1895 by Julius Caesar Newman, J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the oldest family-owned premium cigar maker in America. For four generations and 126 years, J.C. Newman has been handcrafting many of the world's finest cigars. J.C. Newman is headquartered in an iconic 111-year-old cigar factory in the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District of Tampa, Florida. At this factory known as El Rahol, J.C. Newman wrote premium cigars by hand and hand-operated antique cigar machines. The J.C. Newman Pencil Factory is the second largest in Nicaragua. It's where Brickhouse, Pelo de Mar, El Baton, Forum, and Yagua cigars are hand-rolled. J.C. Newman's Diamond Crown, Maximus, Julius Caesar, and Black Diamond cigars are handmade by Tobacco A. Fuente in the Dominican Republic. With its longtime partners, the Arturo Fuente family, the Newmans founded the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, which supports low-income families in the Dominican Republic. With education, health care, vocational training, and clean water, visit jcnewman.com to learn more. And by Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has five generations of experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of the Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now, the Cuevas family brings their own barrel to market with Casa Cuevas Cigars. You can try the Casa Cuevas Connecticut, the Casa Cuevas Habano, Casa Cuevas Maduro, La Mandaria, as well as the Cuevas Reserva line. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas Cigars. Casa Cuevas Cigars, from our casa to yours. And by Aventura Cigars. Aventura the Explorer is the first creation by Marcel Noble and Henderson Ventura. Immediately after lighting up the Explorer, the Mexican wrapper will delight the aficionado with its dark chocolate flavor. After a while and pleasure, the Dominican filler will flatter the aficionado's palate with wonderful spicy and other aromas and unite it with the wooden sweetness of Ecuador. Try Aventura the Explorer and explore the wonderful experience. And we're going to get to our industry deliberation segment. Um, and the industry deliberation segment is sponsored by Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. There is no deliberation when it comes to Dumbarton's track record since launching in 2015. This has included six consecutive top three appearances on the half wheel and consensus, including the consensus number one cigar of the year in 2020 with the Mi Carita Tricky Traca. Visit dttcigars.com to find a purveyor that carries the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. So, Aaron, before we kind of get into the topic I want to talk about today, um, I think this is something I want to mention. So news came today, uh, the Drew State uh, canceling the events for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, 
and um, want to get your thoughts on that. Um, I, I got to be honest, I still was surprised. Um, not surprised that Drew State was the first maybe to pull the plug, but um, I actually was talking to Joe over the weekend. They were monitoring it. Um, if Joe was playing poker and keeping it close to the vest, he did a really good job is what I'll just say. Because, um, you know, obviously they, I think they were, con- they were concerned, but I didn't expect to see get the announcement we got today. Especially with Connecticut barn smokers scheduled for next week, I figured they were going, they they were going full steam ahead at this point. Yeah, um, you know, during the pandemic, they were you know very open that they were you know looking out for you know their employees number one, and that you know they were gonna you know shut down uh, events and not do the trade show, and people weren't working from the office, all that kind of stuff. So that you know. They took it very seriously, and uh, this I think shows kind of that continuation of that commitment to their team. Um, you know, things are kind of ramping back up in regards to you know the Delta variant and things of that nature, and um, I think that that kind of coinciding with people feeling as though things were lightening up and they're getting out more, and you know you see start you start seeing people getting you know the infection rate you know creeping up. Um, yeah, I think it's. You know, the DE25 is a really big event, and uh, I think that they wanted to probably get out in front of that one. Um, you know, the, the Barn Smokers, you know, it's a big event, but it's not, it's probably going to pale a bit in comparison to how, how big DE25 is. So um, they probably want to get out in front of the September event um, to try to, you know, not inconvenience people as much. Uh, maybe some people hadn't purchased their flights or some of their lodging or whatever there. So um, yeah, I'm a bit, I'm a little surprised, um, but I'm also, I'm not, you know, yeah, exactly. this, this could just as easily, you know, get as out of control as it was, you know, 12 months ago. Um, if, you know, people don't take things seriously. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a bummer, but, you know, I applaud them for, you know, taking a stand for their, for their, their team. Um, cause the last thing you want to do is you want, you know, have someone on your team, um, get sick cause they're having to do events with the company. Um, you know, and people could say that, you know, they're, they don't feel comfortable and not do it, or they can feel like they're obligated to do it because they're trying to get back out since they've been away for so long. So, um, you don't, you just don't want to put someone in a position where they, they are feeling as that they don't want to say something about it and something bad happens. Um, because at that point, um, you know, the people that are irresponsible probably won't feel very good about that. So, um, you know, they want to keep everybody safe and I appreciate that. I, I did too. I mean, it was disappointing. Don't let me wrong. I think uh, I think they didn't take the decision lightly. They knew big people made travel plans and booked flights and stuff, and that had a. I don't think this this was a a decision that was lightly made, but um, like you said, this is consistent with their what they did in 2020, um, and I think it was a responsible decision, um, and I knew it was a tough decision. I saw some comments on social media. Most of the comments were not negative. So I think there were a few, there were a few, but not, you know, I didn't see, you know, most people even who bought tickets, um, and I spoke to a few people who bought plane tickets, I should say, and tickets to the event were very understanding. A lot of people were very pleased that even though they didn't cancel the event per se, they pushed it into 2022. Right. Um, they were very pleased to find out they were getting refunds, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, they didn't, they could have said, Hey, we're just rolling this over to 2022. Right. Um, good move by Drew state, you know, take making people whole on that one. And then they'll get the first chance, I think, to get their tickets back in. So, um, you know, the, uh, the barn smokers, I, I thought for sure they were going forward with the Connecticut barn smoker. I yeah. was wondering about the other ones. I, I, I was, but I figured Connecticut was a week away, a week and a half away, a week, actually a week from Saturday away. Yeah. Um, I guess that Joe Grow is not going to be planning his airport uh, barrage on me. Unfortunately, I, don't think so. I feel I feel bad for him. <laughs> I feel bad for him on that um, because I was really looking forward to that. But I know those. I know Joe has been working nonstop around the clock, and I know D twenty five. A lot of it was falling on him, and um, you know, I, I just I applaud the company for making that decision. That decision. Now, do you think this is the beginning of a wave we're going to see? Mm, that's questionable. Um, there's a lot of stuff in October planned. Yeah. So October and November, there's a lot. So I think you have Cigar Fest, you have Big Smoke, Lazona Palooza. 
Well, I mean, you have uh, Rocky Mountain in like three weeks, right? Ro- Rocky Mountain. I, how can I forget that? I feel so, bad for those guys. I, I hope they, can I, you pull know, it. Yeah. I, I don't know what, you know, if they move, keep moving forward or not. Uh, that's a tough call as well. I mean, it's an, I mean, it's an outdoor event that maybe takes a little bit of the pressure off, but, yeah. um, you know, I, I just got the email like two days ago about the Jewish state party the night before. Right. So that's yeah. clearly off. So uh, and today I got the email about the, you know, the Rocky Patel event, which was supposed to be right before the DE event. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think some people will move forward on things and some people won't. I think it's yeah. just going to be a, a kind of a feeling of each company. I could see how people want to keep moving forward now that things that they feel like things have opened up. They want to keep yeah. on that trajectory. So for them to pull that back, um, I don't know. It's going to, you know, they are selling a lot of stuff. They want to keep selling a lot of stuff. Maybe that's the driver. I, I don't know. But yeah. um, if you see what, if you see what's put the industry in this position, it's been people not attending events. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. You have to, each, each person's going to have to evaluate on their own, but I could see people definitely shutting stuff down again. Um, instead of in regards to the travel and stuff like that Yeah. Uh, for the brands, but uh, I'm sure some will, some will continue to do what they're doing right now. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I think it's going to be on a case by case basis. I think some will be dictated by obviously uh, what local jurisdictions do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the indoor events are more danger, is what I'll say. Yeah. Uh, give Drew State credit. They, they, they took all their employees off the road again. So uh, they're going to be doing virtual at least probably for the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, Cigar Fest is a big one. I mean, that's a big. That's a big one. It's, and I know, it, I don't know if it's outdoors or indoors or partially in both, but I think it's like under this really, like it's under a covering, but I yeah. think it's kind of outdoors ish. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. Uh, you know, I don't know what the, it, yeah. what the building looks like, but it's I, that's from pictures. That's what I recall seeing something of that nature. Yeah. I, I guess I feel bad for all of these events. Um, I know Lazona Palooza, I don't know what they're doing. So, I mean, they're, right. you know, that's an indoor event. And that's, yeah. I was concerned about going to that just because it's, it's still a very crowded indoor event. Yep. Um, I have a, I'm supposed to go to Tampa the last weekend of the month for the JC Newman. JC Newman's hosting the KMA 10 year anniversary. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go if they have it. Right. Cause I feel like I committed, but right. I'm probably going to basically go to the event and be in my hotel and that's it. Um, I don't think I'm going to do any other, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to do any other socializing. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think that's how I'm going to approach it. Um, but I'll, you know, whatever they decide, I haven't talked to Abe on it yet. I hope, you know, I know there was a lot of planning that went into that too. So, yeah. uh, they're selling tickets for that one. It's, that's a ticketed event for people who want to come that day to do a whole thing in the factory and everything. So, yeah. And JC Newman, I'll say this. Uh, I went to the factory in, um, May. This is, and look, they were very strict on, on, um, Amount of people you had to wear a mask on the tour. Um, right. They were being very, very diligent about that. So, I think you know. I wish. I hope. All, I hope no one. I hate to see anything happen, but you obviously want everyone to be safe as well. Right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, but I, I gotta say, I think Drew State did a good job with that. So, mm-hmm. I want to give them some credit there. Um, this last topic, right? Um, we kind of hit some of this with Abe, but I actually was inspired by this topic from another thing. And they're basically candidates for like a brand change, right? Whether it's a new name or new packaging, right? Mm-hmm. Or even a reblend, right? I'll tell you what inspired me on this. I went to AJ Fernandez's booth and they repackaged the Puro Especial. And I just loved how they repackaged it. I thought that that line needed a repackaging. The new packaging looked great. Um, they didn't change the name. And they, but they did tweak the blend a bit. And I thought this was, hey, this was a great example of maybe upgrading the brand mm-hmm. a bit. And uh, I, I don't know if you smoked, but I smoked it. And huge difference between the old Pearl Special and the new. I'm not the okay. only one who commented on that, um, at least from the guys who were in the booth with me that day. Um, I just want to know, do you have some maybe cigars that maybe they can use a new name or maybe a brand uh, or a packaging uplift uh, off the top of your head? Um. I don't know. I mean, maybe to this would kind of trigger me with like maybe brands that I think are good that maybe don't get enough attention. Yeah. Um, or things like that. That's so what like, I'm thinking. Yeah. Something like um Vegafina would come to mind. 
That's a good uh, one. You know, it's like a, it's, it's a brand that's put out some good cigars, but like it's super under the radar. Um, I don't necessarily know that it's, it's a packaging need that needs to change. It just it's it needs some kind of a boost uh, to get it out to the forefront for people to smoke those cigars. Um, shoot. I don't know. It's that's tough. That's tough it's, for me to think a, about. It's, it's a tough one. Like Vega Fina was actually a really good one. Cause I think if they maybe emboss those bands a little more, right. Mm-hmm. I think they would be just a little more appealing. Now I understand that's a value price brand too, but white bands are tricky sometimes. And I don't know. I, it's not that I dislike and again, This is not us disliking anything. We're just trying to say, all right, if there's, if there's a candidate, cause cigar companies do this all the time. You know, Carlito was even talking about upgrading Casa Cuba's packaging, which I love. Right. Right. So this ain't this ain't a knock on anything. Sure. I'm like, yeah, that would be Vega Fino would be one where if they just kind of embossed those brands a little more, you don't have right. to kind of completely redo them. You certainly don't have to touch the brand. I think it would be, I think it would really benefit. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's a good one that came to mind with that. Um, you know, I had I had a couple that were kind of interesting there. Um, you know, I was going into I was going into the uh yeah, I, I was thinking general originally with Macanudo. Mm-hmm. They they did it. Actually, I forgot they had done it. They made a change a few years ago with it. Um, so I was I forgot that they have a newer style Macanudo band on some of the legacy stuff, but I think it does look a lot a lot better as far as that goes. Um, I, I liked I liked what they did with that. Um, you know, I think Davidoff for the most part has been I don't I wouldn't touch Davidoff. I don't think I touch anything in the Davidoff line. Mm-hmm. Uh, they already did Avo and Camacho. Right. Right. Um, Nika Rustica was would have been one for um, for sure with the um, you know before they made the change and and, and that, the change I would have made is get them into boxes and, right. and I think that was that was a good one as well. I, I'm gonna put one out there and it may be a little unpopular. And it's not that his bands are bad, but I think his packaging is confusing and, and it's Southern Draw. I just think mm. it gets a little confusing um, at times. Um, the Ignite, whether it's an Ignite series, that's really a Rosa Sharon or Jacob's Ladder. Or, um, you know, I remember he did those, what are the duettos he was doing? The, yeah, the yeah. two cigars banded together, yeah. I, yeah, I like that concept, but I just, I think the banding's just a little confusing sometimes. And I, I just saw he did the Pravada one, which nothing against the, I just think it's a little confusing that um, how those are primary banded versus secondary banded. Mm-hmm. Um, so that one, that's one that comes to like, I think he did a good job with desert Rose, right? Keep the pink Rose of Sharon band, but the black secondary band, I thought right. that was really good. Um, but, um, I thought Jacob's ladder was a little confusing with that one mm-hmm. where, you know, again, I kind of would make those Jacob, those Jacob's ladders, uh, brimstones stand out a little more maybe than the original Jacob's. Ladder. It, was, it was a subtle change. They put a little more white into it, but I think, you know, but I think I like what Robert Holt did when he went to the colors. I just think it's still a little confusing what he does with that at times. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's one I'll throw one out to you. So CAO kind of quietly re-released the Cameroon. Okay. All right. And they brought the Cameroon, like the Cameroon used to have that gold band, mm-hmm. but now they made it like they made it a classic CAO band with the CAO logo and stuff like that. I think that was a good move, and maybe I'd like to see some of the other CAOs do that. Um, maybe it would give La Traviata a boost again. Um, right. Maybe the old CAO uh, Maduro can get a, a boost like that. Um, that was one that I thought could really benefit from maybe some of those lines that are a little more dormant uh, to do that. And maybe just in general, um, kind of make the CAOs, you know, he's had some of those other ones that, that have come out, like the... Um, um, the last couple of years, oh, geez, uh, the uh, Bones right. and um, the one the year before that, which, uh, why I'm, oh, the Session. I mean, yeah. I just maybe kind of consistentize that because I think that 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 CAO logo that you see on like the Brasilia, uh, et cetera, I, I really like that. And I think that would help a little. And you just use different colors to make it pop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Um, I know Carlito talked about Casa Fuente, uh, Casa, Casa Cuba. Mm-hmm. I like those bands, but if he could do better, right. that's great. I think he could do better uh, than, than go for it, you know? Yeah. I mean, better is nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, and I liked, you know, we talked with Abe a little. I, um, 
I didn't really understand a lot of the repackaging that he had done until he talked about what he did tonight. Right. Um, there was a, there was a bigger motivation he was doing with that. And he was changing his blends on top of that, which made some sense. So, um, I liked that he rebranded the name of PDR 1875 with the Santiago name and they're different. They're, they're more Dominican focused blends. So I liked what he did with that. Um, I was a little confused by that at first. I didn't really understand what he was doing with that. So that was something I thought that was positive with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, as far as negatives, we've seen we've seen the negatives um, over the years. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the biggest one, and he, I don't think we're talking out of school here because he's admitted it, was when uh, Eric Eric changed the 601 bands back about 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah. Eric will tell you. Eric, I remember having a phone call. My first conversation with Eric, someone put him on the phone with me at an event. And I, he brings it up to me. He's like, what do you think of those new 601 bands? And I'm like. And I really know Eric. I'm like, well, you know, Eric, I start him and how he's like, I hate him. <laughs> I'm yeah. losing sleep at night over these things. He's like, yeah, you could be honest with me. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> so, I mean, that was one I think that was, and then it, it took him a while to recover from that. And they kind of went, they kind of restored them and then kind of embellished them a bit after that, which, right. you know, so I think they got that one as well. Um, I like when they changed the Murcio Lago band mm-hmm. because when they went from the red, so they had three, they had the EO one. Right. Right. Then they had Eric's redoing of the blend in the in the in the black, the black and red. Mm-hmm. And then when he moved the blend to AJ, he moved it to silver and black. And it kind of indicates, OK, that's the tobacco coming from AJ right now. So mm-hmm. I thought he did a really good job with that. Yeah. 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 Yep. I have one that I don't like the bands. And this is probably maybe going to be an unpopular opinion, but right. uh, the Romacraft Intemperance. I do not like the bands. I don't think they're bad. I mean, they're compared still, to they're, the they're, other they're, lines, right? right? They're compared to the other lines. Yeah. It's just, um, they seem out of place to me, especially the whiskey rebellion. Um, it just doesn't do it for me, man. It just seems like it's a step down from the other lines. I know the cigars are good. The cigars are great. Uh, it's just I don't that think the, the bands, bands are terrible, but yeah, I think you could, if, if, if that was a candidate to put something like do something more with the bands and do something innovative, like he did with Chrome Magnet, that would be, that would be a great candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I even, I like what he did with, um, with the Neanderthal band, but that's more cro and, and then Baca, I thought was pretty cool too. Um, yeah. with that, but I would agree with you on that one. I think that's, that's a really good one as well. Uh, could do that. Um, you know, I don't know if those need packaging changes. I think they're, they're, they're pretty good. I, I'm not a fan of these like 50 cabinet boxes, like that right. Asylum's got. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think, man, they, I, I don't know, but it's work. But Tom Azuka will tell you it works for them, you know? Right. Um, but to me, I'm like, if you get a 10 box, 10 count box of those, you'd sell a lot of boxes in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that was an interesting one. Um, it was, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking at the show, anything else that came to mind with that, um, Gurker, I thought was interesting with their packaging because, mm-hmm. um, Gurk is kind of going to those rap style boxes right now that they're yep. getting away from the Kaizad stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's sim- it's much more simpler packaging, but I think there's still a lot of nice detail and artwork with the, with that packaging. So it's just, I think it's gonna be a tougher sell because people are used to getting the crazy Kaizad packaging, you know, mm-hmm. at, you know, and ordering that stuff and, you know, and, they, and it's used at events and stuff like that. So I like what they've done, but I, I wonder how it's going to translate longer term for them how about yeah. Dion's bands um the bands are nice and simple but it's very unless you know the sizes it's very hard to make out what some of the cigars are so I can understand a bit of confusion there um it, it's possible that it maybe hurts sales a little bit that people can't figure out what's what um, so I could I can completely understand that. Yeah, I mean, I I think they're simple. I think that's what he wants. Um, and you know, I I can tell what the I can tell what the Maduro band is. It's got the maroon band. You know, I can tell what the original documents ones are. Um, I'd like to see the Candela maybe have a different band, but I guess the white and black works on the Candela. Mm-hmm. So it's a, I love I love the uh, the cigar privy bands, and I love the uh, the ultra bands. I think they're good. Yeah. Um, 
I like what Pete did with some of his band changes. Um, like I love when he came back out with the black labels, he, he redesigned the black label band. Right. And, and it was what I liked about it. it he embossed it a little more, but yeah. it, it still had the feel of Tatawahe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking that would maybe be good for his brown and red label stuff. I just don't know how that would translate to a brown or red label. Nice. I don't know if it would be worth it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Cause those are kind of like, you know, kind of like fate, like faded, faded colors for those other yeah. lines. So it may, it may not play as well. I, I understand. Yeah. That's kind of where I, I yeah. that's where I would be concerned with it. No, he did some with the red label. I think he did some with the red label. The Veracruz had it. Okay. The Veracruz, I think, had it, but the brown label did. Uh, but I really like when, when the black labels came out, they popped. I'd love to see them on the monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I'd love to see them on. I think they look, I think they would look really good on that. But would it take away when you lay those monsters in one of those coffin boxes? That's right. Uh, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of easy to Monday morning quarterback on that. Yeah. Uh, but I, like my favorite bands of Pete is I'll say La Marquesa is me. It's a classic band. Um, always, always like that. The, uh, the old Triumphadors, I like that one as well. Yeah. I was going to mention that with a couple more brands to jumpstart. So like, uh, you know, Cabo uh, a little bit Cabo more of that. Is, yeah. You know, El Triumphador, a little bit more of that. La Cita Criollo, maybe that a little bit more of that back. Uh, yeah. I mean, Pete's got quite the portfolio that, uh, you know, and uh, there's a lot of stuff in there yeah. and uh, a lot of good stuff in there. So, um, yeah, just a ton. I noticed, I noticed with some of the more recent monster releases that face doesn't have the cut, the cut thing anymore. Mm. So he was doing the cut face on, I think the pudgies and the little monsters. When he went to the Lanceros, I can understand the cut thing wasn't going to work, but I think right. monster mesh doesn't have it either. Mm. Um, that, I, I kind of miss that. I, I know it's probably an expensive proposition to do that for sure. Um, but I, I love that cut. Fit. I think that was so unique what he did with that. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that was pretty cool with that. Um, I had one other on my list and I, I didn't write it down. I got another one. Okay, go ahead. One where the bands are confusing and they could use some sort of an additional something else to it or whatever. Uh, but like uh, Viaje, Skull and Bone stuff. Totally. I mean, he's just confusing. Um, white so. label, white label. Yeah. Should have a secondary band on, even if it's just a black and white thing. This is what the cigar is because right. I have white labels. I got to be honest with you. I don't know what they are. I mean, I, and I didn't, I didn't, I took them out of cello, which was a mistake. Now I have these white labels and I don't know what I'm smoking. You know, I bought a lot of these. <laughs> I have a whole tray of these <laughs> in my humidor. <laughs> right. So they're very confusing when that happens because, and I think you want people to know what those cigars are because if they're candidates for future releases, I think you really want to, uh, you know, you want that to sell. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Jay Davis in the comments asked about our thoughts on Padron. Um, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. So I've just recently gone back and I'm doing, re- I've done reviews now on the 64 series, yeah. natural Maduro, the 26 series, natural Maduro. And, you know, looking at the bands and yeah. the bands look old, man. They just don't, I, I know, I know it's sacrilege to say because people that like Patron like the consistency, like they like how you know, it's always the same kind of thing, but um, Damaso has like a, a more, current version of I what like they the, have I, I love the damaso band yeah but the 64 especially uh it's just kind of old and just looks old so I, I know that it's not and not you know there are some old bands that you could say like this is just classic it doesn't really it's kind of timeless and stuff like that i don't think the patron fits that mold yeah. i think it does look aged looks dated and the damaso shows you what a new version could yeah. look like so you have that to kind of compare to so I have the one I I have the one I want as I mentioned. Okay. Um. It's the Aladino Maduro. So I think the Aladino Maduro uses the same band as the Aladino Corojo. I think that one needs a different band. It's it's very confusing sometimes when those cigars are laying in the humidor. Yeah. I like what he did. I love what he did with the Connecticut. I love what he did with the Cameroon, and I love what he did with the Vintage. Um maybe a slight tweak to that, put a red stripe. I don't know something 
some a slight tweak just because they are. I have I I can tell in my humidor which are which, but it's a little tough sometimes because <laughs> I have mm-hmm. the Aladinos in like one section out, out of boxes. So those will probably be the ones. The only way that I'm able to tell most of them is because uh, I have a bunch of the Rothschild Maduros. Um, right. No, I'm sorry, the Corona Maduros, the Corona mm-hmm. Maduros, and they're box press, right? That's the other thing. They're box press, but um even so i have some he gave me some rounded maduros that's why it gets confused uh, okay he actually did some soft launches of the rounded maduros so i have some of those that's where it gets confusing but yeah that would be the one i'd probably still change even though it's box pressed yeah yeah all right anything else not off the top of my head all right so i think we beat that one to death so um just a reminder no show next week yep. uh we'll be back um in two weeks we'll, we'll We'll, we'll tell you what that show is um, soon once we yeah. kind of finalize what that is. Um, and, uh, and the week after that, McAuliffe's going to be on on, on the right. uh, 26th. So stay, yeah. And then we have to figure out episode 200. <laughs> so, That's, yeah. There you go. Yes, we got 200. We're not canceling it. We're not canceling it. No, we're not canceling it. Uh, <laughs> I have a couple more ideas, but we're trying to get a couple of people. So, uh, so uh, yeah, stay tuned on that. We want to make that one a special one. Uh, yep. that's a, that was a huge goal, Aaron, to hit the 200 mark. So mm-hmm. for me, uh, that's like, you know, pretty historic if we get to that. So uh, with that, so um, and uh, yeah, that's about it, man. So uh, thanks to Abe Flores. Thanks to our audience, uh, everyone who tuned in. Um, that's going to wrap up primetime episode 197 to the Annals of History for thursday august 5th now friday august 6th on the uh east coast uh we'll see everybody two weeks from today have a good one everybody take care see you guys